And we're live with our pre-show today of our 2-2011-02 Core 2 A-plus study group. All right. Hello, chat room. Hello, everybody. Let's pop out the chat. Pop out the chat. Pop out the chat. There we go. That looks good. Now we got, uh, we've got we got presentation needs to come up on the laptop. It does. It's working. My fingers are crossed because... Um, we had an internet outage about an hour ago. So <laughs> we know what that means, don't we? Is that, that's right, it's out of the system. We've now taken care of the outage for today. Let's, let's hope that's what it was. Hello, chat room. Hey, everybody. Thanks for being here. Uh, we got about uh, eight minutes before we get started, eight and a half before we get things going. I hope every, everybody's doing well. This is our second study group of the week. We had our first Core 1 study group on Tuesday this week, and we're back for another. So we'll see how this goes. California checking in. West Coast, up early. Thank you for being here. First thing in the morning, start you off with a study group. It's one of those things. They get, they get to watch the late football games, and they get to watch the early study groups. It's kind of how it works here in the U.S. Thanks for checking in, folks, who are in Tacoma, Washington, and Hampshire, England, and we got Virginia is here. Fresno, Sao Paulo is here. Georgia, we got, got some folks down in Georgia. I should say up in Georgia from where I am. There's Tampa, folks in the Florida checking in, fellow Floridians. We got Austin, Texas, and Wyoming, and Washington, and London, UK. We have uh, Idaho. Way to go. We got New, New York City. We got uh, Fairborn. We got Germany. We've got... New Jersey, Albany, New York, not Albany, Georgia, Albany, New York, two very different places, I'm told. Uh, we have Kosovo and Denmark and Indianapolis and Switzerland. We have Dallas and Dallas, Dallas twice, Dallas and Dallas. That's a lot of Dallas. North Florida checking in, Fort Lauderdale checking in. See, folks around, folks around the state are, are here and doing things. Let's do a quick check of... Our cameras, they look good. Our cameras are all this this middle row on my switcher. And since you're looking over my shoulder, those are the four cameras I'm most worried about, which is the headshot. That's me. Hi, how you doing? There's the one you're looking at, which is the bird cam. It actually has labeled on it. It's hard to read there, but it actually says bird cam on it, so I know what it is. It is the, the iMac that's right in front of me is the third one over. That's what I'm looking at, of course. And then the laptop is the fourth video over here, you can't really see the laptop very well there, but that's what it looks like in that window right there. And so I'm looking at those, making sure, are they working? Are they are they flashing? Are they funny looking? Are they are they fuzzy? Are, they, are there problems? No, they're not. Everything looks good. So we're doing fine there. Uh, this is the streaming server. It's really a streaming appliance from Blackmagic. Uh, and it's doing fine, too. Our cash rate at 3% is exactly what it is supposed to be. That's the number we want. That number changes, especially if it goes up, we're in trouble. It means the network is down. We're cashing more than we should be. Uh, so apparently, 3% of what I'm doing here cashes out to be, I don't know, pretty quick. By the time I say this, you see it in 15 seconds, 20 seconds. So it's pretty good. It's pretty Pretty quick, maybe even less than that these days. 59 tally now. It's 58, apparently, where uh, where this says it is. It's hard to see, but that's, that is, can't zoom up on it. It is 58. It is, it is a little chilly because it's the winter time. It's the winter time. We just don't have, uh, there's no ice and no snow. But other than that, it's just, when it's 59, it's 58 degrees, we're, we're just miserable. We are horribly miserable here in Florida. We don't like it. Uh, that's not entirely true. Mrs. Professor Messer loves it. She thinks it's great. And uh, and for some reason, we're still together all the time. We somehow manage to put those differences aside. And so far, so good. Uh, let's see. Um, yep, phone is there. Five minutes to go. I think we're in pretty good shape. I think we are in pretty good shape. 50, 58 is just too cold for me. Because it's, we are in North Florida. It's a humid cold. It's a wet cold. 
uh, just like the, the heat is a wet heat. So it feels like it should be colder than that. In fact, let's look at the app and let's see what those um, people over at uh, AccuWeather think the feels like is. And uh, they say that for where I am right now, um, they say it's 58, but it really feels like 66 outside. It does not feel like 66 outside. If the question is AccuWeather really accurate, it is not. It is not, but it's, you know, that's 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 where I went to because they have that feels like number that they promote that they think is the right thing. It's just it's just not good, is it? It's too cool. Adam says just got home from passing the A plus core two. Thanks for your information, Professor. Congratulations, Adam. That's you don't even need this study group. You don't even have to be here. This isn't about you anymore. Congratulations. That's gotta feel good, right? That's gotta be a good feeling. Now, uh, I'm assuming, well, I shouldn't assume, but uh, are, are you are you not, uh, are you still taking the, the core one? Are you not? There's there's your map. I didn't have the map up. I have the map. The VVox map. I don't know if we'll do a map on the next one. I'm thinking of using a different web-based front-end Q&A starting the beginning of the year. So for next month's study group, I am thinking... I will have another one, a different one. I think. I don't know. The problem, is, like at most most things, it's it's cost. It is it is expensive to do some of these things. And the one I want is uh, that's just the, the one we're working with. Uh, Professormesser.com slash QA gets you to the VBox. There you go. That'll that'll get you there. As it turns out, or at least on Tuesday, the app did not work. We. The app sent you over to the website. So going to professormuster.com slash QA effectively is the web front end. Another reason why maybe this is not the right platform for me. Maybe I need something that takes it up another level that has a little bit more panache, a little bit more professionalism, a little, maybe I'm talking about myself. Maybe, that, maybe that's what's going on. Oh, what am I doing for Christmas? Uh, what am I doing during this holiday season? Um, I don't know. I don't, I'm doing live streams. That's what I, that's what we're doing. We're bringing a little bit of the live stream to you. So I guess you could get the QA from there, or the QR from there. If you wanted to use the app, that would at least get you there, but it's just going to pop you over to the web front end, or at least it was. So maybe somebody in the chat can tell me if it is still popping you over to the web front end. So we'll see. I know it just brings up this enormous QR code. So big. <laughs> that doesn't even look real. It looks like I sort of put it into the picture. But no, that's that's really there. That's really an actual thing. And when I click on it, it whoop, brings it right up. Remarkable, isn't it? It's really designed, if you're doing corporate presentations, you have a room full of people, you can pop that up on the screen. Everybody can just put up their phone and now they're on the, now they're on the right connection. How are we on time? One minute. Oh, my gosh. Er, my gosh. Let's see what we got. One minute to go. Um, I think we're. I think we're fine. One minute to go. I think we're okay. Don't forget the fudge. Well, there will be fudge because uh, Uncle Phil will be involved at some point. In fact, Uncle Phil was here for Thanksgiving. He dropped off some fudge for me because he's he's that kind of brother and uh, set me up pretty well with all kinds of fudge at UnclePhilsFudge.com. It's so good. Yeah, you should check that out. We don't have any we don't have any any uh discount codes, unfortunately, right now. He's just crushing it right now. I and they uh Uncle Phil's fudge is the uh is the one. That's what we're looking at. Okay, let's see if we can get um that was uh that was an odd live read, wasn't it? That was the worst live read ever. <clears throat> Okay, that's working. Uh, I think the rest of this is working. I think, I think, I think. Where's my Where's my actual time check? It is It is ready to go. It is time to do a live stream, everybody. Let's see how we do. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the December 2023 Professor Messer 220 1102. That's the core two 
A plus study group. This is where I will ask you questions that come from the A plus exam objectives, and then you get to tell me what you think these answers are. The questions aren't that bad, but they do prepare you for the topics that you will run into from those exam objectives. We would love it if you are here live. And by the way, those of you that are here live, thank you so much for being here. We would love it if you could participate with us. And the best way to do that is to pop open a new browser window and visit professormesser.com slash QA. This is going to bring up a screen for this service we use to answer these questions called VVox. At least that's what we're using right now. We have uh, this VVox app that you could download from an app store. Last I checked, though, which was a couple days ago, it was popping us back over to the web front end. So you may just go to professormesser.com and save yourself a lot of time. Professormesser.com slash QA and save yourself a lot of time. Now, if you do that, there will be a question waiting for you. That question is here. Where are you joining from? There, there's the question. I'd like to put this up so that you can at least see what the VBOX ID number is for this particular session, which is 135-063-667. So you've got a few choices there. One of the things I like to do before we jump into new questions is to give you a question that you've seen before. This is the only question today that you will have seen because it is a question that is a one that we did last session, so a month ago or so when we had our last event. And this question is one that asks, which phase of the malware removal process may require when PE. Now, I'm going to give you some answers, but as we go through this, keep in mind that we do not want to answer in the chat room. Please do not answer in the chat room. Instead, use the links on your screen like professormesser.com slash QA to answer this question. So the question again is, which phase of the malware removal process may require when PE? Is that the educate the end user part of the process, the quarantine, the schedule scans, the remediate or the verify symptoms. It's going to be one of those. Now, if you think you know the answer, use any of the links on your screen. ProfessorMesser.com slash QA is the best one right now to be able to get in there and answer that particular question. We're going to come back to this question in just a moment. So we'll we'll don't worry. We will find out the answer to this one before we're done. Thank you so much for being here. As I mentioned, we do one of these study groups for A plus once a month for core one and once a month for core two. We already did our core one study group a couple of days ago. This is our core two study group of the month. And of course, we're doing a lot of other things. In the meantime, I'm posting new videos to YouTube all the time. What? You haven't subscribed yet? Well, of course you need to subscribe. Simply visit professormesser.com slash YouTube and you could subscribe to our channel. It's up to you whether you click the bell or not. I hope you do, so you know when we do these live streams. Of course, we also have daily pop quiz questions for A+. You can find that at professormesser.com slash Twitter. We also have those same questions with a pretty picture over at professormesser.com slash Instagram. So it's a good way to find what we may be doing online. There's also, we'll talk more about other sites, but there's more. Of course, there's more. The exam that we're going to talk about today is the 221102. This is the Core 2 exam that was released on April the 20th of 2022. So it's been out about a year and a half. So very, very relatively young, I guess. We're halfway through the, or almost halfway through the life cycle of this exam, which means it's probably going to retire somewhere around the time frame of November of 2025. So you have plenty of time to study and earn these, uh, this particular certification. The exam itself is the 1102. It is graded on a scale from 100 to 900. So it's an odd little scale. But you do need to earn a 700 to pass this exam. That's a pretty decent number, a little bit more than you need for the core one, which is a 675. So as long as you get a 700, you pass this particular exam. You pass both the core one and the core two, and you're A-plus certified. And as soon as you do that, you are certified for three years. And of course, you can renew that certification as you go. You don't have to drop it off. You probably will never take the exam again. You'll just keep renewing. The Core 2 exam itself has four different domains, and we will have questions across all of these domains 
today. There is operating systems, security, software troubleshooting, and operational procedures. We will go through, of course, all four of those particular domains. I'll also let you know that this uh, will have a replay, a video replay of this is available immediately afterwards on YouTube. I also create an audio-only replay in podcast format. So if you have a podcast listening program that you like to use, you can add this to your podcast listening app by going to professormesser.com slash podcast. If you listen to streaming media services, so if you're on Spotify, all you have to do is search for Professor Messer and you'll find all of our podcasts listed on that service. And if you use a different service, we may be there as well. And if we're not, just let me know. I'll start working along getting those on that particular service. So we'll we'll figure out how, how all of those work together. As I mentioned, there is a video replay of this available immediately after we are done today. And if you wait about a day or so, you'll find that my marketing manager, Lori, will go through that video and put timestamps into the YouTube video description so you can find everything that you're looking for, whether it's a question we ask in the first hour or one of the more detailed questions that tend to come up in the second hour. They're all listed there in the YouTube video description. Hey, Lori. Uh, she is going to uh, make sure she gets that done. We've got years of those. We can go back. Hopefully, that's something that can help you find what you're looking for when you're trying to study for these exams. And there is, of course, when we're not here doing a live stream, we're usually hanging out on Discord. You'll find myself and many other people on our Discord at professormesser.com slash Discord. It is our chat and are really a collaboration tool is how we tend to use it because you can pop open a new chat window at the bottom. You can create your own uh, room inside of this Discord server, and you can even go through Q&A, look at videos, and discuss exam topics with other folks. It is a great community to be a part of. We'd love to have you join us. You can find it at professormesser.com slash Discord. Also let you know that eventually you will want to take these exams. And of course, you can go to the CompTIA website and pay full price, or you can visit professormesser.com and get a price that's already discounted. You don't have to have a discount code. You don't have to install new capabilities and extensions into your browser or whatever craziness they're doing these days. Why don't you just visit the website at professormesser.com slash vouchers and the discounts are already built in. Not only do you get a discounted voucher, so you pay less for your exam, I'm going to give you extras that you can't get anywhere else, and that is in the form of my exam hacks ebook. I have taken a number of industry exams, probably uh, well above 20 IT industry certification exams at this point. And with all of those, you learn a tip or a trick about studying and in some tips and tricks that are useful to know during the exam itself. So I put the, all of those tips and tricks into the exam hacks so you can know exactly how to help study. And we might make you a few points in your exam itself by following these strategies, these tips, these tricks, or these life hacks. You can find all of that on our website at professormesser.com slash vouchers. Let's go back to that question I asked, which was, which phase of the malware removal process may require WinPE? Is it going to be educate the end user, quarantine, schedule scans, remediate, or verify symptoms? We have all five of those available. Let's see how you did with this question. And you can see that 58% of you say it's the remediate phase is where you would use WinPE. You also have kind of a three-way tie for second place between quarantine, schedule scans, verify symptoms are all 13 or 14% a piece. And the last one is 0%, say educate the end user. So technically, I don't know if that one really counts at all. Nobody really answered educate the end user. Well, if you're using WinPE, WinPE is the, uh, the Windows, um, well, I'll show you. Well, I'm sort of talking ahead of myself. Remediate is describing the process of removing the malware from a system. So already we know remediate must be the right answer here. One of the things you can use to do that that might help is safe mode, but you might also find yourself installing or running a copy of the Windows pre-installation environment, the WinPE. WinPE is 
when you're installing Windows, you may not even realize it, you're in Windows PE, Win PE. So it's a way that you can get a basic Windows configuration up and running that allows you to interact with the drive and the contents on that drive. And it's something that might help you be able to remove either files or the malware itself because the system technically has not booted from the operating system on disk. You've booted instead from WinPE. So this can be very, very handy. And if you are someone who's struggling with the malware removal process or just trying to get access to the system, WinPE can be a lifesaver. We use WinPE for so much more than just malware removal. It's a great overall troubleshooting tool. So every technician I know has a way to plug in either with a USB drive or with a connection across the network or in some cases even optical media where you can start Windows PE and do troubleshooting on that system. So if you answered Remediate, you got that one absolutely right. Windows PE would not be used to quarantine anything on the system, at least not ideally. Uh, we're way ahead. If we're wanting to quarantine the system, we're trying to disconnect it from the network. Windows PE has nothing to do with disconnecting it from the network and other devices. Scheduling scans is done once the malware has been removed. And we've got verifying symptoms as really the first thing that you would do. Hey, I think the system has malware. I've just verified the symptoms. Now let's go through the rest of the malware phases. So all of these are important, of course, but the process where we may be using Windows PE to boot up and perhaps remove some malware from our system will be in the remediate phase. And 58% of you got that one absolutely right, which I think is more than last month. So we, we've learned something or we're much better this month than we were last month. We can think of it that way. Well, that was the last question you will see that is old. Now everything else is a new question you haven't seen before. So we are at the point of our live stream where I like to give you a question that is not multiple choice. That's because on your exam, the first set of questions you get, usually about a handful of questions, are going to be what CompTIA calls performance-based questions. PBQs, performance-based questions are anything but multiple choice. They could really take any form. They could be fill in the blank. They could be a matching question. It could be a drag and drop question. It could be popping you at a command prompt and having you perform a particular function. You might have to put things in a particular order from highest to lowest or fastest to slowest. There's a lot of different things that could be thrown at you. Now, fortunately, everything in these performance-based questions come directly from the exam objectives. So in my mind, as long as you know the objectives and you understand that content, you'll do just fine on the performance-based questions because it's not about how they ask the question. It's whether you know what the answer is. And as long as you know the answer, it really doesn't matter how they ask the question. So I have one for you today that uh, I mentioned earlier you could run into on this one. This is a question that asks, at the Linux command line, rename the file 2023.txt to 2024 dot text. And that's what I would like you to do. And I've got a screenshot here of a Linux front end. And you can see on this Linux front end, I'm in my documents folder. And indeed, there is a file there that is called 2023.txt. We won't be needing that anymore. We need a newer one that we want to call 2024.txt. So we'll just, we'll just change the name of that one. But how do you do that? We're in Linux. This doesn't work the same as being in Windows. And for the purposes of your core two, there are a number of Linux commands you need to know. I think this is one that if you're familiar at all with Linux, you probably knew this one instantly because you tend to use those file manipulation tools quite a bit. But in this particular case, I'm, I want you to plug it in. I want you to tell me what this one happens to be. So let's see what you think the answer is. I've already put into our VBOX. So go to professormesser.com slash QA and Lock in what you think the answer is. It's a fill in the blank. So I want you to put the entire command line down of what you would type in to rename that file. So maybe you know what it happens to be. I think if you're someone who is kind of working through the details of Linux, it's so close to using any other operating system at the command line. It's just that all of the terms are different. In many cases, the syntax is very different. So let's see how you do when you start working through 
these different options and what the different things might be for this command. I, I can't wait to see. In fact, I should probably pop open the things you are typing in right now to show me what you believe the answers might be. There's definitely some folks that are taking a stab in the dark. Where <laughs> Nope, that's not, that's not it. We've also got some other folks that are maybe back in the Windows days. So this is one, whenever you start working through problems and challenges with these, uh, these applications and these operating systems, you do have to know the specifics of the syntax, and you can't use a Windows command to do things on Linux all the time. In fact, rarely can you do that. Very Sometimes we do have some continuity between the different operating systems where the same command will do the same thing. That's pretty few and far between, I think, as we look at it. So we've got a number of you that have, have plugged in your answers. How many people have indeed answered this? We've got a, a large number of you that have put in your answers. So let's, let's see what I think the answer might be. So we're at the Linux command prompt. We're in the Documents folder. And we can see there is a file in the Documents folder called 2023.txt. I would like to change the name of that. I want to rename it to a different name. And as you may or may not know, based on the answers that came through, uh, there is no rename command in, in at the Linux command line, at least not by default. There is no move command to, to, be, to be at least not spelled out. Instead, it's a little bit different. It's a command. It's still a move command. But instead of moving it to a different part of the drive or the file system, Instead, it's going to be moving it from one name to a different name. So there is the command line that we would use, MV for move, and not the word move. So a number of you put that one down. But it's not the word move. It's MV that we would use to be able to do that. MV uh, with the first the name of the file that we would like to change, in this case, 2023.txt, a space, and then the name of the file that we would like it moved to. And we were moving it now to 2024.txt. So that is what we are doing inside of Linux. And the reality is, whenever you do a rename in Windows, you're sort of moving it there as well. So everything about that stays exactly the same at, with that file as it was. All the permissions are the same. All of the configurations in that file are the same. The contents of the file are identical. But the difference here is that we are really looking at uh, the Linux command line and changing the name of the file. Seems like we would make it a little more straightforward. Oh, we're going to change the file. We're going to we're going to rename what that happens to be, but we're not. We're instead going to use MV to be able to do that. The MV command itself is something that you would use to rename. So there's the syntax on the screen for those of you that are working through trying to see what these happen to be. And this is a very commonly used command. You will do this all the time. You will use this constantly to be able to change the name of files, directories, and other objects in the Linux file system. MV was the command we were looking for. And a number of you, I'm going to I'm gonna just flip through the answers that came through because this was a fill in the blank. I don't have a way to compile these. Some of you felt that you needed uh, higher uh, permission. So you thought maybe a, a sudo would be what was used. Nope, you don't need sudo to be able to rename a file, at least not one that is something that you have rights and permissions to change. But the vast majority of you got this one spot on. Uh, you did really well. And those that, those of you that didn't get it exactly right, you came very close. So these are things we should know. Make sure you go back to the exam objectives that you are familiar with all of the command lines that you need to be able to use on your command. They are listed in the objectives, and that will be a great way for you to really prepare for and expect that perhaps some of these commands may show up on your actual exam. So you, you did extremely well on this one. I'm going to give you uh, five stars. You did great on that one. Or is it one star? Whatever the better stars is, you get it on this one. You did a great job with this performance-based question. Let's now jump back to some multiple choice questions. I have another one for you. This one is asking, a user in the European Union has requested the removal of their personal information from a website. 
which of the following would apply to this request? Would this be PCI DSS, PHI, GDPR, TPM, EULA? I know some of these things are not pronounced that way, but I'm, I'm sort of keeping them consistent as we go through this. So again, the question asks, a user in the European Union has requested the removal of their personal information from a website. Which of the following would apply to this request? Would it be PCI DSS, PHI, GDPR, TPM, or EULA? If you think you know the answer, please don't answer in the chat room. Instead, you want to go to the links on your screen, either, well, I think the best one to go to really is professormesser.com slash QA to lock in what you think the answer might be. A lot of people answering this one. You can see the numbers cropping up very quickly there as we step through these, which makes me think maybe we know this one really well, but it doesn't always work out that way. So I'm not going to not going to look at the answers until we have a look at uh, until we finish up and hit the button. So I don't want to surprise myself. See if you know what this one happens to be. A lot of abbreviations on these exams. Uh, a plus has its own set of, of abbreviations we need to know. But also, it's very useful if you know abbreviations, especially abbreviations that um, that are specific to the operating system. There's a whole acronym list in the back of the exam objectives. And by the way, when you get into Network Plus and Security Plus, there's even more acronyms that we need to know. So this is not something unique to this exam. It's just something that we do constantly in the information technology is be able to know what these are and how these work. Let's see how you did with this one. The question again asks, a user in the European Union has requested the removal of their personal information from a website. Which of the following would apply to this request? Is this PCI DSS, PHI, GDPR, TPM, or EULA? And if we stop our polling, we can see the answer that 73% of you answered was GDPR. 18% of you say the answer is EULA. We have 5% that say the answer is PHI. And then we're down to 1% for PCI DSS. And again, poor 0% for TPM. TPM didn't get any love there. Well, if somebody in the European Union is asking about this, there is specific legislation that is in place that requires an organization that does business in the EU to give people access and rights over the data of theirs that you happen to be storing. And one of those things might allow them to, uh, to request a removal of their personal information. And that is the General Data Protection Regulation, the GD. PR that mandates that particular requirement. So you as an end user have control of your own data. At least that's the idea. Didn't exactly work out that way in the in the final final law, which means you know it's a law because it's not perfect. Uh, but it does give you some control over those things. Some some people refer to this as a right to be forgotten or a right of erasure, which technically doesn't really describe this particular regulation, but it comes close. So I think it's a, a relatively broad, albeit inaccurate way to describe this particular regulation. It does speak to the concept of what we try to do with this. Indeed, GDPR is the answer that we were looking for. And many of you knew that that was the regulation that you needed to know. 73% of you did. We had 18% of you that chose EULA. This is an end user license agreement. If you are ever installing software and when you click the install button, it pops up a lot of text and all of us just scroll to the bottom and we click submit or OK or I approve or I agree. That is an end-user license agreement that you just ignored that you are now bound to. One of these days, I'm going to put something in the EULA that requires you to send me something, that, that, to do something for me. Um, but at this point, the EULA is pretty well established as being that end-user licensing agreement. It dictates how you're able to use the software. What rights and permissions do you have over the software and how you're using it? This does not, EULA has nothing to do with an organization uh, requiring or being compelled to delete your personal information. So it would not, in this case, be an end user license agreement. PHI refers to healthcare information, your private healthcare info 
is something that is important to control, not only in the European Union, but in all countries around the world. And many uh, countries and states and, um, and regions have laws on the books about how personal information about your health care is to be protected. And, uh, and who has got access to that data. So in this case, we're not talking about healthcare data. All we know about this data is that it exists over in the EU. So PHI in this case would not apply. PCI DSS is the payment card industry's control, or it's not really a regulation, but a set of guidelines and rules that must be followed by the credit card companies and people that store credit card information. And if you are part of that data security standard, that's the DSS part of the payment card industry, then you probably are already familiar with protecting credit card data, making sure that it is encrypted, making sure that it's well protected. Uh, but in this case, we weren't talking about credit card information. We were talking about living in the EU and your private details. So it would not be PCI DSS. And no one chose a TPM, Trusted Platform Module. This is a, a piece that goes into a system, into a, a personal PC or mobile device that is able to do some cryptographic functions for us. We often see the TPM associated with full disk encryption, for example, because we can store the private keys, effectively the decryption keys associated with that full disk encryption. We can create and store that information in the TPM that's local on those systems. Well, TPM doesn't have anything to do with removing your private information in the European Union, so that's probably why 0% of you chose that particular option. Not really telling you something here that you don't know. Uh, that, the answer here by far, 73% of you say the answer is GDPR, and you are absolutely correct. That is the correct answer. Let's now go to another question. I have another multiple choice question that we can go through. This one asks, a network, a network administrator has identified eight hops between the local network and a SaaS provider. How did the admin make this determination? Did they use NetStat, TraceRT, IPConfig, Ping, or NetView? Five different options. All five are things we should know from the exam objectives. The question again, a network administrator has identified eight hops between the local network and a SaaS provider. How did the admin make this determination? Did, was it NetStat, TraceRT, IPConfig, Ping, or NetView? If you think you know the answer, please don't answer in the chat room. Instead, you want to go to professormesser.com slash QA to answer this question. There it is on the screen. Now you can see it. That is the question we were looking for. See if you happen to know what this one is uh, and see if you can piece out what all of these different options do. Not only do you know or perhaps know what this answer is, it's also important that you know what all of the other answers do. So you're not done. If you think you know the answer and you've locked in the answer, you're not done yet. Your extra credit is to go through all of the wrong answers and tell yourself, oh, I know what that does. This is what it does. I know what that one does. This is what it does. So make sure you go through all of those and know them. And of course, this, again, is a subset of the different uh, commands and different command line options that you must know for the core to exam. There's a lot. There's quite a few. So make sure you're familiar with them. They're all in the exam objectives, so it shouldn't be too hard to figure out what the difference differences are and the different commands you need to know before you walk into the exam room. It's going to be pretty important. Let's see how you did. The question asks, a network administrator has identified eight hops between the local network and a SaaS provider. How did the admin make this determination? Was it NetStat, TraceRT, IPConfig, Ping, or NetView? We'll stop the polling and see how you did. 85% of you. That's a pretty big number. Say it's trace RT is the answer. And then, of course, it's all single digits after that point. Ping with 6%, NetStat with 5%, IPConfig at 2%, and NetView at 2% or so. All of these commands are things you need to know. But if you're trying to figure out how far away is a particular location, a particular site, a particular device over the network, and how far away is it by number of hops? Well, we can use traceroute.
to be able to do that. In Windows, that's the trace RT command. In Linux and in Mac OS, of course, it's the full name trace route because we're not limited by that eight character that we used to have in the in the days of Windows. Now, of course, we can use much larger executable names, but the problem, of course, is we still have some of those older utilities that we need to use. Those older utilities are still using the smaller, shorter names. This is using uh, a number of features within uh, the trace route to be able to list out all of the different routers between here and the destination device. We refer to these different routers that we are going through as hops. We are hopping through the router as we go. So for example, from my office, from my uh, office, if I would like to perform a trace route to a DNS server that is maintained by Quad9, uh, as the name implies, the DNS server for Quad9 is 9.9.9.9, .9 literally four nines, quad nine. And if you can look in this, you can see that quad nine is eight hops away from where I happen to be. And I have a list of every router that is used along the way to be able to get from where I am to that hop uh, for this trace route. And you can see every router along the way. In some cases, trace route has even performed a name resolution. So hopefully I can see the name of these devices hop up if it has been defined in a DNS. In fact, some of these have. Some of these are in Florida. Some of these are in Georgia. And others don't have a name associated with them at all. Of course, you can enable or disable that functionality when you use trace route. But now we're sort of getting outside the scope of the, of the exam itself. It's important. I would say it's probably most important that you understand what all of those commands provides. In fact, it's important to understand when you would use these particular commands. But another important part of this is that you know how to functionally use at least part of these. I think it helps with the learning process. So you might want to run your own trace route command. This is one you can do on your computer right now. If you're running Windows, run trace RT to the 9.9.9.9. You'll, of course, get a different number of hops than I do or you should, uh, that'd be creepy, wouldn't it? If you have exactly the same hops that I have, they're in the house. It's, the call is coming from the house. We also have on this Trace RT, if you're running Linux or Mac OS, you wouldn't use Trace RT. You would use the full name Trace Route. So same functionality, same syntax, same capability, same thing you'll see on the screen, but it's just Trace Route. Running is either Trace RT or Trace Route. That is the right answer. 85% of you got that one right. You can see that uh, we do have other options here. NetStat stands for Network Statistics. It will tell you a lot of information about the data that is going out of your computer and coming back into your computer. But it doesn't tell you what the different hops are between you and a remote location. It only tells you that you're talking to an IP address that is at a remote location. We also have the ping command. Ping is very good at telling you how uh, whether a remote device on the network is accessible or available or is responding, but it doesn't tell you how many hops there are to be able to get between you and that remote device. So ping isn't going to help you very much there either. IP config gives you a list of the IP configuration settings on your computer, on your Windows computer. And then net view is a Windows command that allows you to view the available shares that are in a particular subnet or on a device. And in this case, the only command that shows any information about looking at number of hops is indeed the trace RT or trace route command. That is the right answer. And 85% of you knew that was the right answer. You got it right. Perfect. You got it, got it right away. You got it right, right away. That really didn't go well. We're going we're gonna to move forward, though. I will tell you, you've probably seen already, we've had a few questions. And these questions are all over the place. Well, that's because the A-plus exams ask you a lot of information about a lot of different topics. You need to know about operating systems and security and networking and hardware and troubleshooting and cloud technologies and even more. And of course, I have videos that can help you learn all of this. We cover every topic in my training courses, but it's 137 videos across 19 hours of content. And I realize that... And it'd be great if everybody was able to watch all 137 videos and spend 19 hours doing that, but not everybody has that kind of time. So what I did was create a consolidated view 
of everything that's in every video. These are called my course notes. We have both physical versions that you can see that I'm holding in front of me. This is an actual book. Yeah, so as they say in the industry, perfect bound. That's what you commonly see on those soft back uh, types of of books, but I also have a PDF version. Here's the PDF version. Obviously, it's identical to the physical version that I have in front of me. And this has all of the text from these videos, all of the graphics, all of the important charts. They're in here. All of the command prompts that you would need to step through, all of the different settings for the Microsoft Management Console, the control panel settings, the network, they're all in here. Everything's in here. Not only do we have the Core 2 course notes available. We, of course, have core one course notes available. If you need both of those, you can purchase them together and even save a little bit of money. And if you get the physical version that I'm holding here, this is one that is printed on demand for you. And while you're waiting for it to be delivered, you will get the digital version for free, no extra charge. You can download it immediately and use that. So all of this is available on my website. If you'd like to learn more about that, Go to professormesser.com slash 1102 notes or simply follow the pull down menus at the top of the site. This is also a great way to support what we're doing here and hopefully gives you something that you can use for your exam. In my mind, that is a win win. Have a look on the website, professormesser.com slash 1102 notes. Let's do some more questions. Next one on our list says A Soho router opens an inbound port. Each time a specific application is opened, which of the following would best describe this activity? Is this screened subnet, SSID broadcasts, UPnP, DHCP reservation, or static WAN IP? We are, we are not referring to a location in New York. We're referring to something else when we say that it is a Soho router that opens an inbound port each time a specific application is opened. Which of the following would best describe this activity? Is it screen subnet, SSID broadcasts, UPnP, DHCP reservation, or static WAN IP? If you think you know the answer, go to professormesser.com slash QA and lock in your answer. Please, no answers in the chat room. Please, no hints in the chat room. You're you're all doing very well along those lines, by the way. Thank you. Um, and see if you know what the answer might be. The number's not going up quite as fast as the others, which leads me to believe we might have to think through this one. We'll see see how it works there. Some people are asking if I can, can sign the course notes that are going out. Unfortunately, these course notes are made on demand for you. They are made specifically for you, the one that you receive. And they're printed and shipped out of a number of different places around the country and indeed around the world. So unfortunately, I'm not in the facility that prints these. So I'm, unfortunately, I'm not able to touch them, sign them, see them, smell them, do anything to them before you see them. You're the first person, I guess the second person that gets to touch them. Whoever's manning the printer at that time, they're the one ones who are boxing this up for you and sending it out on my behalf. So unfortunately, no, I don't have a way to sign them. I'm so sorry. Let's see how we did with this question. A Soho router opens an inbound port each time a specific application is opened. Which of the following would best describe this activity? Is it screened subnet, SSID broadcasts, UPnP, DHCP reservation, or static WAN IP? And the answers that come up have about 49, let's say 50% of you say the answer is UPnP. And then we have almost a four-way tie for second place. We have 17% that say DHCP reservation, 12% that say screened subnet, 10% that say SSID broadcasts, and 10% that say static WAN IP. And what's interesting about this one, no single digits. So we are, we are all in in one of these. We're all sort of all over the place with what these might be. So we have a router, an inbound port, opens automatically when you open an application, this really speaks very well towards the functionality of universal plug and play. UPnP is the abbreviation of that. It is designed to be a way to simplify the administration of these routers so that when you are launching an application that needs inbound connectivity, this application can tell the router, hey, I just started up 
And since you support Universal Plug and Play, please open that port and send everybody down to this server so that they can properly gain access inside on the local internal network. Uh, that is obviously going to require a type of network address translation and a port forwarding, which is usually how this is described in your router, as an automatic port forwarding process. Uh, the problem, of course, if you're thinking through this, is hold on, an application is telling my router to allow people in from the internet, and it just does it without telling me. And if you think that perhaps that might be a problem, you might be right. There is a significant security concern there. There's not necessarily a security vulnerability with that. This is working as it is supposed to. This is supposed to do this. It is supposed to put your network at risk. That's how we designed it, of course. Uh, but I would say that probably the best practice, if you're going to going to have anything that you need to disable inside of your Soho router, small office, home office is what that stands for, then you'll probably want to disable UPnP. So you can see on my Soho router, it all at, generates firewall rules automatically using UPnP and can generate firewall rules automatically using port forwarding. And you might want to simply turn those off. That may not be what you were really trying to do. So a very good example of universal plug and play. This is different than plug and play. Some of you may have even seen that in Windows, is that Windows supports plug and play, which is back in the day whenever we would install hardware, you had to also manually install all of the drivers for that hardware. It didn't happen automatically. But one of the things that is kind of nice about the, the latest versions of Windows when they introduced this is you plug in the hardware, you turn your computer on, and then it magically installs the drivers for you. You don't have to go through that driver installation process anymore. So plug and play is what that is called. But plug and play is different than universal plug and play. See how easy we make things in this industry. It's, it's so simple. Just as Java is not the same thing as JavaScript. In fact, they're completely different from different people. They were designed to do different things, but we call one Java and one JavaScript. What could be more difficult than that, right? We make this so easy in our industry. It's That's one of the situations we run into. So don't be thrown by the universal plug and play moniker. We were really talking about being able to control the configurations of that Soho router. And indeed, the universal plug and play was the right answer and... How many people answered that one? About 49, let's say 50%. We're right in the middle with that 50%. That's a good number. Uh, let's see how we do on the next question. Let's do a troubleshooting question, shall we? This question asks, a technician is troubleshooting the Windows message, quote, your computer is low on memory, end quote. Which of the following would provide a summary of all applications and their memory use? Would that be event viewer? Task Manager, Boot Configuration Database, Device Manager, or Settings. This comes up quite a bit. If you're ever troubleshooting a computer and it shows you the message, your computer is low on memory. Well, is it? Well, how do I know what's causing my computer to be low on memory? Well, we need to start something that can tell us about that. Is that something Event Viewer, Task Manager, Boot Configuration Database, Device Manager, or Settings. It's got to be one of those. If you think you know the answer, you can put it in right here, ProfessorMesser.com slash QA, or use the links on your screen for VBox.app. Uh, this is one that all five of these are real configuration options, are real utilities that you can use. Each one of these utilities provides you with a certain type of information. So if you happen to know the answer to this one, make sure you go to the other four that are in this list and you know what each one of those utilities does for you. So that's your extra credit on this one, is not just knowing the answer to the question, but knowing what the potential answer might be if it was a different question. Does that make sense? I was I was going there. It got It got a little convoluted there near the end, but I think you know what I mean. Uh, I want you to be able to know what all these different options are from the exam objectives because you could get a question on any of these on your actual exam. 
So let's see how you did. A lot of people locking in their answer pretty quickly on this one. The question again asks, a technician is troubleshooting the Windows message, your computer is low on memory, which the following would provide a summary of all applications and their memory use. Would that be Event Viewer, Task Manager, Boot Configuration Database, Device Manager, or Settings? How'd you do? Let's see how you did. We have 84%. The times when I think I've got a question for you that's really going to stump everybody, and we end up getting 84%. Well done, by the way. Event Viewer came in at 8%. Device Manager at 4%, and we've got Boot Configuration Database at 1%, and Settings at about 1%, 1 to 2%. Well, most everybody said Task Manager is what you would use, probably because they've been in the situation where they have had to look at how much memory is available on their system and what's using up all of the memory. In case you're wondering, it's Chrome. <laughs> That's the answer. I should have just said, what's the problem? And then you would have had to fill in the blanks, and the answer would have been Chrome is the answer. Our browsers tend to use a lot of memory. And so we tend to see whenever there's a memory leak or where there is a browser that just is not performing well, it always uses up all the memory in our system. It's remarkable how much is, is really used by these. So by using Task Manager, you can break this down. Instead of just seeing I'm out of memory, you can see uh, by each individual service or process, how much memory is really in use. And you can pick it out and see, OK, that's the one using the most memory. Let's close that out and see if we can get the system at least back up and running again. So Task Manager is the right answer. Uh, we might also want to consider modifying our virtual memory settings. But again, we don't want to fix the symptom. We don't want to just make it so that the the memory hog on our system just takes longer to eat up all the memory. Instead, what we really would like is to solve the memory problem completely. And I think that Task Manager is probably your better choice for that one. That's why that 85% of you said Task Manager is what you would use, absolutely. Now, we do have other options here. Let's step through what each one of these are and when we might use them. We can start with Event Viewer that 8% of you chose. Event Viewer is a list of it's effectively your Windows log file. This will list out all of the events that have occurred inside of Windows down to the individual service, looking at security on your system, understanding the underlying system configurations and what's running. And we can look at application use as well. Everything is in Event Viewer. So if you are wondering, if you go up to a user and they go, yeah, I got a blue screen yesterday. Um, it told me to restart the computer, so I restarted it. And, and you ask, well, do you recall what it said in the blue screen? No, I really didn't pay attention. I just rebooted my computer. Well, it's OK, because everything is logged. And if you want to see what the blue screen was that occurred, you can simply ask the user, when was this yesterday? Oh, it was this time frame. Let's go back and look at it in our event viewer. We also have Device Manager. 5% or so of you chose Device Manager. Device Manager is a way to look at all of the hardware devices that are configured in your system. I guess in some cases, these could also be software devices. Uh, the Device Manager is there to give you that connection between the hardware that you're using and the way the operating system is able to access that hardware. I mentioned earlier about needing to install a device driver every time you installed hardware back in the day. And these days, of course, the device drivers are installed automatically with plug and play. Well, those device managers and that process is all managed in Device Manager. So that's what we would use for that function. Settings is a selection and new, relatively new option in Windows where we can configure different settings of the operating system. Things like understanding and modifying the way the desktop looks or modifying the way the operating system itself operates. All of those are inside of the Settings option inside of Windows 10 and Windows 11. And it's something you should absolutely be familiar with. In some cases, the settings inside of that option can also be changed from other apps or other utilities as well. But I think Microsoft is forcing us down that road that we're just always going to use settings from this point forward. And then lastly, we have a boot configuration database. Some of you have probably familiar with this as the BCD. So whenever you're modifying the BCD configuration, it's really referring to the boot configuration database. This is the database that contains information about where Windows is on your system. So when your system boots up, and it finishes its power on self-test, passes things over to the storage drive and says, OK, start up your operating system. Where, where's your operating system? 
That's, that's a good question. Let me look. I have it right here in my boot configuration database. Uh, there it is. It's in C colon backslash windows. Well, thank you, boot configuration database. I'll go over there and start up your operating system. That's the purpose broadly of what a BCD is used for. So those of you that answered task manager, 85% of you got that one absolutely right. That is your correct answer. And you did very well with that one. So let's see if um, I have another question here. I'm really curious as to if I want to do this next question or if I want to skip through it because we just had, I'm going to skip over it. So we're going to do a different one. Uh, I think we should do one on Mac OS. So uh, we're going to do one right now on Mac OS. Here it is. This question asks, a technician is working on troubleshooting the file system on a Mac OS desktop. Which of the following file systems would be unique to Mac OS? Would it be ext4, ntfs, xfat, fat32, apfs? Got a few options there. A technician is working on troubleshooting the file system on a Mac OS laptop. Which of the following file systems would be unique to Mac OS? Would that be ext4, ntfs, xfat, FAT32, or APFS? If you think you know the answer, follow the links on your screen, professormesser.com slash QA, and lock in your answer. See what you think the answer might be. I am. I'm kind of jumping around my own questions at this point. We're figuring these out. Now, of course, on your exam, you need to know a lot about Windows. A lot of the exam, most of the exam, from an operating system perspective, is about Windows. But as we've already seen, there are big sections on Linux, there's another section on Mac OS. So we need to know at least the fundamentals of those different operating systems. And in many cases, how you would troubleshoot different capabilities, what utilities you would choose inside of those different operating systems. You need to know quite a bit about Linux and Mac OS. You're going to run into it. There's every organization in the world's running Linux. And most organizations in the world have some Mac OS users. So I've worked with companies before where the majority of their corporate users were on Mac OS. So you walk into a, one customer in the morning, everybody's on Windows. You walk into a customer in the afternoon, everybody's on a Mac. So really, I guess it just depends on what type of company you are. Not a lot of companies all Mac. Uh, that one was. And of course, they ran the same scenario that, yeah, but we got a little bit of Windows here and we got a little bit of Linux here because you can't get away from it. Yeah, there's those all these different operating systems will eventually show up at your at your doorstep wanting to be fixed and you're the one who has to fix it. So it's good to know these different options for operating systems like Mac OS. Let's see how you did with this question. Again, the question asked, a technician is working on troubleshooting the file system on a Mac OS, Mac OS laptop. Which of the following file systems would be unique to Mac OS? Would that be ext4, ntfs, xfat, fat32, or APFS. Let's see what you chose. 88%, I'm being shown the door at this point. 88% of you say the answer is APFS and being able to work through these. So that's a that's a very good option. Uh, obviously, most of you chose that one. But we've got other file systems. All of these are real file systems. And we need to know where these come from as well. EXT4, NTFS, XFAT, and FAT32 are all around 1, 2, 3, or 4% of the answer. Well, there's no messing around with this one. The A in APFS stands for Apple. It's the Apple file system. That is exactly what that's designed to be. It's relatively new in the world of operating systems from Apple. Uh, it was added to High Sierra, which was not something, it was not that, that long ago when we uh, found the High Sierra and running APFS inside of it. This is also a file system that you can find on iOS for your mobile iPhones and iPad OS, which you can find on the Apple tablets. This is designed for SSD. You know, Apple has the luxury, if you will, of deciding in mass, we're going to move all of our devices to SSD all at once. And they effectively did that. They did stage it in over a matter of time, but it was a very short period of time. And now uh, they needed a file system that was optimized for this type of storage. And so they created APFS for exactly that in mind so that they would have a file system that ran with the Apple hardware and ran very, very, 
very efficiently. And APFS was their answer to that. Now, because there's APFS, doesn't necessarily mean you're using APFS. And in fact, Mac OS and Linux and Windows can also access files and information that may be stored in other file systems. All of these are real file systems. So we'll start at the top. EXT4, the extended file system version 4, is one that very commonly is associated with Linux. You might also see it in your uh, Android-based mobile devices as well. NTFS is a file system. The NT on NTFS is the new technology. This is new technology from 30 years ago. That's when it came out. That's the problem with naming something next generation or new is that it is only going to be that for a short period of time. But NTFS is still what we call it. It is the new technology file system that is exclusive to Windows, but you can access NTFS storage devices from other operating systems as well, albeit with some different levels of capability. Uh, some operating systems can only read NTFS. Some can both read and write to NTFS. It depends on the operating system and the capabilities that you might have. But that's primarily, NTFS is primarily associated with a Windows device, uh, but doesn't necessarily have to be. Uh, FAT32, I'm going to jump down to FAT32, is a very, um, very antiquated at this point, a very old file system that we were running back in the DOS days. Back, be back before there was Windows, we had the DOS, and we were running FAT32, the 32-bit version of the file allocation table, the FAT. Uh, that's where that comes from. Uh, the file allocation table 32, an extremely capable file system, a very reliable file system, one we used for many, many, many years. And you can still format and install and use FAT32 on your system. In fact, it makes a very good file system to be able to move between different computers because a lot of operating systems are very aware and very comfortable at reading and writing to the FAT32 file system. These days, though, most of the, these systems have moved away from FAT32 to a newer version, if you will, of the file allocation table. This is the XFAT. XFAT was specifically created by Microsoft to support file systems on our flash drives, on USB drives, to be able to plug it in. Because these USB drives are much larger than the maximum capabilities that FAT32 can provide, we needed kind of an updated version of FAT32, if you will. This didn't necessarily turn into that, but XFAT is an extremely capable file system. It is optimized for those flash drives. And perhaps even more importantly, Microsoft has shared a bit with how this file system works. And so you can also use XFAT in Linux, in Mac OS, and other operating systems as well. That is uh, the all the different file systems I've listed here. And there's a few more that you need to know that come from the exam objectives. Make sure you have a look at all of those exam objectives so that you're familiar with them. So let's, uh, let's get another question in while we're here. This next question asks, a company is installing bollards at a data center facility. Which of the following would be the most likely reason for this installation? Would it be limit vehicle access to a specific area, monitor facility access from a central console, secure any equipment in the data center, limit access to a room without the proper ID badge, or alert for any motion in a given area? If you think you know the answer, you want to answer by visiting professormesser.com slash QA and locking in your answer. Please no hints in the chat room. Please no answers in the chat room. Uh, we'll figure out what all these happen to be. For those of you just joining us, we are in our 2201102 Core 2A Plus study group. So this is where this question comes from. Uh, if you have your exam objectives, you're probably already familiar with this one. You probably already locked in your answer because you know exactly what this one happens to be. See if you know your answer. Uh, I know we're getting near the top of the hour. We're going to get this question. I still have another question left. So we're in good shape. Don't worry. We have more questions for you. We'll get a lot of those in as we're going through. I will remind you, though, in the second hour, I will be taking your answers and being able to, um, to answer anything that you might have. You can input those answers also at professormaster.com slash QA. There's a tab across the top where you can put in any questions that you would like to ask, uh, something I always like to do as we're getting ready 
for that next part of the study group. Let's see how you did with this one. Still very slow at getting answers in, but we're going to we're going to push through. The a company is installing bollards at a data center facility. Which of the following would be the most likely reason for this installation? Is it limit vehicle access to a specific area, monitor facility access from a central console, secure any equipment in the data center, limit access to a room without the proper ID badge? or alert for motion in a given area. Let's see how you answered for this one. We have 77% that say it would be used to limit vehicle access to a specific area. We have 8% that say secure any equipment in the data center. 8% also said to limit access to a room without the proper ID badge. 2% said monitor facility access from a central console. And 3% say alert for any motion in a given area. I think some of you are wondering, where's this question coming from? Well, of course, in your core two, there is an entire domain on security. And security is not just associated with the digital world. We also have to be concerned with security in the physical world. And so you may find that in your organization, you may not have even realized it, is that you have bollards that may be in front of your building. Maybe they're around your building. Maybe they're in your parking lot. Uh, in, in the United States, we tend to just call these barricades, or we tend to call them just a, a big, uh, a, a big uh, way to limit, and a very visible way to limit where things are able to go. So they're, mar they're marked red, for example, like this picture shows. They're very visible in being able to see what they are. Um, in front of the, the Target that's in my town, they have these enormous red balls in the front of Target that are very, they look like Target. They look like the, the middle of the Target logo. But they're actually bollards to prevent somebody from driving their car into the building. That's really what that's designed to be, is to prevent someone from accessing that. Obviously, we can walk in. We can walk through these barricades, these bollards that are there. But they are, uh, of course, going to limit a vehicle from being able to get there. I guess if you put them close together, you could even prevent people from coming in. Normally, we would use a fence for something like that, though. So we can allow people in but prevent vehicles from inside of a particular area. This can be pretty useful if you want to... Uh, to make a walk area safer so that no one can dr drive their car accidentally through a particular area. Or maybe you want to be sure someone's not able to drive a car into the building itself. You'll sometimes also see these around very important parts of the organization. Maybe there is um, there's a gas that is contained. There's a gas tank. So we'll put bollards around the gas tank to protect it. So sometimes there's a safety aspect to this as well. Uh, this is the real key and understanding what you might want to know or what you might want to do with these. So, uh, again, very good option to know about from a physical security perspective is limiting vehicle access to a particular area using a bollard. We also have 8% that said security equipment in the data center. Normally, we would use a locking cabinet for something like that. Limiting access to a room without the proper ID badge. There could be an electronic lock that we are using for something like that. We've also got monitoring facility access from a central console. Uh, we've also got um, alerting for motion in a given area. Uh, a central console has nothing to do with bollards. And alerting motion in a given area, we would need some type of sensor for that. The bollard certainly isn't going to do that either. So you've got a few different options when you're working through these particular challenges. We did great with that one, though. 77% of you got that one absolutely correct. You were spot on. You knew what the answer to that one was. It wasn't even difficult. So that's, uh, that uh, is we're close to the, the top of the hour. We are at the top of the hour. But I want to get one more question in before we are done here today. This next question is one that comes directly from my practice exams book. For those of you that aren't familiar with my practice exams book, this is something I wrote because I was looking around the internet and realizing that a lot of the practice exams out there really weren't great. Uh, many of them that are available free on the internet are either off topic or giving information that is incorrect. Even things that you might buy from a third party. I found a number of third party commercial products are not written with style or tone that has anything to do with the exam. And in some cases, they're giving you questions that come from versions of the exam that are no longer available. So they're all out of date. Uh, that's not what we want either. We want some type of Q&A 
that gives us the same feel as the actual exam and the same complexity in the questions. And this is my practice exams. Instead of telling you about it, let's look at my practice exams book. Uh, this is my practice exams book for question 41, A41. We're on page 15 of my practice exams book. This question, again, no answers in the chat room, please. This question asks, a system administrator is configuring a server to use eight bootable partitions on a single SSD. Which of the following partition styles would be the best choice for this configuration? Would it be MBR, MTFS, disk part, or GPT? So you have a few options available there. All of these are real things again. Uh, again, we, we may even know what NTFS is. So the answer here is when we want to choose. Now, because this is a PDF, I can even annotate this. I might be thinking, well, we're talking about uh, keywords in this. I can highlight them. If we are, are using this on a tablet, we use a stylus to actually write on the book itself. And you can even mark things. If you think you know the answer, you can select the answer that you think it is. Now, the answer for this question, even though I'm on page 15, the answer is on page 77. And this is probably the biggest problem I have when dealing with this type of situation on a PDF is you'd have to scroll, 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 scroll to page 57, page 77 rather. And then when you're done, you'd have to scroll, scroll, scroll all the way back up. But it's a PDF. So I simply put a link in the PDF where I can simply click the words, the details, and it takes us over to the details page. This details page, of course, gives the question again, and it tells you that the answer is D, GPT it explains why that is the right answer. So whenever you start getting into these questions and being able to work through them, um, one of the things that bothers me is when I get a question wrong, a lot of these online or less capable practice exams don't explain to you why the wrong answer is wrong. And I think they're missing an opportunity to help teach or explain better to me why I chose the wrong answer. After all, that's the, the learning process is to bring you back around. You want to make those mistakes so that you can understand why it's a mistake so you won't get it wrong next time. So what I do in every single answer that's in my book, whether it's the right answer or the wrong answer, I explain everything about that answer. So if you answered A, which is MBR, or you answered B, which is NTFS, or you answered C, which is disk part, I explained to you why those answers would not be correct for this particular question. So you were very clear on why that was the case. And if you don't even understand what the question was asking, I put a link to every video associated with these questions in the question itself. So you can, of course, go back to the video, watch this video, and then have a better understanding of what the question is really asking. And then, of course, once you're done with this, you can use your back button. You may not even realize there's a back button in your PDF reader. You can click the back button, and it takes us back to where we started, and we can go to the next question that's on our list. Those are my practice exams. And we have practice exams available for the core one, for the core two. We've got other practice exams for other exams that we support, other uh, certification programs on our site as well. It's an important part of your studies. You should, of course, get a good book, watch these videos, maybe do some hands-on. And of course, you should always test yourself before going into the exam. And I think a great way to test yourself is with my core two practice exams. I told you whenever you're using these, uh, whenever you're working through this, this exam series, that the exam objectives contain a great deal of information of what you might need. In fact, I, I've got to tell you, it is the number one source. I tell everyone, make sure you have the exam objectives. It's going to help you quite a bit. I've got the 1102 objectives up on my screen. There they are. These exam objectives are available on the CompTIA website, and they're free and they tell you everything you need to know to be able to pass your exam. Every topic is listed in here, and they stay almost exclusively to these topics to the point that I will tell people, if you know everything that's in these exam objectives, you're not going to have a problem passing this exam. You're going to do great. So make sure you're familiar with everything listed in here. You can download these by visiting my site, Go to professormesser.com slash objectives, and it has a link that takes you over to the CompTIA site. Or you can easily go to your favorite search engine, type in CompTIA exam objectives. It'll get you there. You'll be able to find it, and it's a free download. You can't beat free. I love the free stuff. 
Uh, we do one of these study groups every month. We did a core one study group a couple of days ago. And of course, we have a study group uh, also scheduled. Currently, they are scheduled for January the I say January the 9th and January the 11th. Let's go to January because I still have study groups in December. There is a on the 13th next week, we're doing our Network Plus study group. Our Security Plus study group is on the 20th of December. And then we currently have scheduled on January the 9th and January the 11th for the next A Plus study groups. So we have a number of different things coming in January. These dates, though, can change. Um, I'm not even sure what my January looks like yet. It's going to be one of those where there's a lot of things happening behind the scenes. So make sure you always check in with our calendar so that you know exactly when the next live event is going to be. If anything changes, I change in the calendar first. So if you're checking the calendar, you are completely up to date to the second. And that can be found on my website. Follow the events link at the top of the page or simply type in professormesser.com slash calendar. Be able to find those. Well, we got through the first hour of Q&A, but we're not done yet. I've got more questions, except now you get to ask the questions of me. You can do that directly from professormesser.com slash QA. We call this our after show. Don't forget that my practice exams and course notes are available on my website. You can find out more at professormesser.com slash 1102 success. We also have discount vouchers and our free exam hacks ebook that comes with those. You can find that at professormesser.com slash vouchers. And don't forget to follow us on all of our favorite social media sites. In fact, if you really enjoyed this video, we would love it. If you would give it one of those YouTube thumbs up, it really does help us quite a bit. It's absolutely free for you to do that. And if you really wanted to make our day, head on over to professormesser.com slash YouTube and subscribe to our channel. We want to get that all the way up to a million subscribers. We are creeping our way there. We are getting towards that final number. So we'd love you to be a part of that and to enjoy that with us. Uh, you can find out more. Uh, just follow these links, type in professormesser.com, and then the name of the social media site that you would like to find us on. That's the best way to do it. Well, thanks for being here in the first hour. Stick around for our after show while I'll take your questions. Otherwise, we will see you next time on our Core 2 A Plus study group. Thanks, everybody. Okay, let's uh, come around to, there we go. I don't like that to be off too much, but <clears throat> I'm getting a sip of water. We're working our way through, but it's time for the after show. So now I need to readjust my screen here so that I am doing after show stuff. We need to hide those results so you get the message on the screen that tells you all about submitting questions. And you can submit those questions to me. You can do that at any time by visiting professormesser.com slash QA and be able to submit whatever questions you happen to have. Um, we'll start in the chat room. We've got uh, Not A Weeb says, passed both A-plus exams a couple months back. Uh, congratulations. This is probably one of the biggest challenges we all have with these exams is making sure we get to the very end and get certified. It is a lot to take in. So congratulations, Not on earning your A-plus certification. Congratulations on passing both of those exams. I always like to start off well, and hear those types of stories when we go through those. So let's now, now go through the process of understanding what you might want to ask me. And of course, you can ask questions that deal with technology. It deals with IT. Maybe it talks about certifications. Maybe it has nothing to do with any of those. I'll take all of your questions. I don't know if I'll answer all of your questions, but I'll certainly talk about doing those and using those as we step through them. So let's start with a couple of questions where we're talking about um, the, the exams themselves. This was a question that came up recently on my website, and I think this is a perfect that it, it was asked. This is from Gary, who asks, Greetings from South Africa. Would you recommend writing Core 1 and Core 2 back-to-back -back, or focusing on one at a time? So this is a common question. Uh, in fact, someone rolled through, it was either in our Discord, I believe it was in a Discord, it might have been in a different Discord earlier this week, where somebody rolled through and said, oh, I'm taking both of these exams on this day. And I thought, and I, of course, responded and said, well, why would you do that? Why are you, are you, do you know about these already? Have you spent time in the industry? 
Uh, are you already comfortable with these topics? Have you already been doing this for a while and this maybe is not quite as uh, as arduous as many people have to go through? Um, they said, no, I'm brand new at this and I'm just going to do them both on the same day. So I recommended, and I think the right recommendation is don't do that. Don't, don't, mm -mm, don't, don't do that. What you would rather, I think, you can do that, but it is not your best percentage pass. It's not the best possible pass that you could have here. If you wanted to maximize the potential of passing both of these exams, I would highly recommend biting off one exam at a time. So you would start with one of them. Doesn't matter which one. You could start with the core two. You could start with the core one. Learn everything you need to know about that particular exam. Let's say we, we got the core one exam. We focus on the core one exam objectives. We read through the section of our book that deals with the core one. We watch the Professor Messer core one videos. We go through the core one, maybe some labs or some hands-on. And then we've gone through core one Q&A. And then we go take our core one exam. We pass our core one exam. We've now earned half of what we need to earn our A-plus cert. Now we can put all of that aside. And in fact, if you look at the exam objectives, there is very little overlap between both of those exams. Core 1 and Core 2 effectively stand on their own. There's very little between them. If we had a, a Venn diagram between them, there would almost be no overlap between those two. And that's by design from CompTIA. Used to be there was a lot of overlap. Now there's hardly any. And that's so that you can study more effectively for these exams. So now that we're done with Core 1, now we can readjust and now focus on Core 2. So I can focus on 1 or I can focus on 2. What you don't want to do is focus on all of it and try to get all of that information crammed into your brain and walk into a room and try to pass both of these. What people uh, have very consistently done is not do well on either exam because it was just too much to take on. I would not want to see you in that situation. So I would highly recommend, I never say highly recommend, unless I highly recommend that you focus on one at a time. It is your best chance for passing both of these. The only time when perhaps that advice would not be highly recommended is you've already done this in the industry for a number of years. You've already been on a help desk. You've already managed desktop computers. You've already managed servers. You're familiar with Windows. You've worked with Linux. You've got hands-on on Mac OS. You already know about the inside of your systems because you built computers before. And really, you need the certification because something at work requires you to have it. That happens all the time. So I tell people in that case, you already know this stuff. Sure, read through all of the content, understand all of the exam objectives. In that case, I think it probably would be okay for you to take this. But obviously, that's pretty rare. That is that is in the epitome of a corner case. They are not going to, you're not going to run across people like that every day. So for the vast majority of us, highly recommend studying for one, taking the exam, and then if you even want to forget about all that, you can, but you're not going to be able to. Then just move over to the next exam and focus on that one. Fortunately, you don't have to worry about this with Network Plus or Security Plus because those two certifications only require one exam. A Plus is a little different along those lines. So this is a good case where you really want to focus on what you're doing and not pile on too much all at once. Hopefully, that's given you a perspective there. Uh, let's do another question along those lines. Let's say that you have worked on getting to take both exams. You pass both exams, and now you are certified for three years. That's the way it works when you earn your A-plus certification, your Network Plus certification, your Security Plus, and a number of other certifications from CompTIA. That certification is good for three years. It expires in three years. If you do not renew your certification sometime during that three-year period, it will expire and you are no longer able to renew it. You don't want to be in that situation. So the question I got from Anonymous says, if you get your A-plus cert, when is the best time to start saving up points to renew your certification if you don't plan on pursuing higher CompTIA tiers? And they've already sort of folded into this question that they're already familiar 
with the renewal process. But for those of you that haven't gone through this before, let me give you a very quick overview of the things you can do to renew your cert because you can do more than one thing to renew your certification. You could take, as, they, as Anonymous mentions here, you could take a higher level CompTIA exam and that higher level exam will renew your lower level exams. For example, if you already are A-plus certified, you could take your Network Plus exam, and the Network Plus exam would renew your A-plus certification. That's kind of nice. Don't even have to do anything. There's no extra money to spend. There's no extra effort on your part. You simply take a higher level CompTIA exam. This person says, well, I'm not pursuing a higher CompTIA exam. That's fine, too. There are other ways that you could renew. You could take a third-party certification exam. There are a number of certification exams that are not CompTIA that would give you either a portion or all of the continuing education unit credits that you need to renew. And this might be a Microsoft exam, a Cisco exam, an AWS exam. There's a lot of different exams. There's a big list on the CompTIA website of third-party exams that you could take. But let's say you're not planning to do that either. You don't want to take a third-party exam to renew. The other One of the other things you could do is you could take the CERT Master CE. CE stands for Continuing Education. CERT Master CE is a computer-based training program that you take. Uh, CompTIA says it can take about six to eight hours to go through it. And when you go through the CERT Master CE and you finish it, it effectively renews your CERT. So if, let's say you had one day left. It's one day before your certification expires. You could take the CERT Master CE, do nothing that day but work on it, submit it, and now you're automatically renewed as long as you get it in before that, that expiration date finally hits. So that's another thing you can do. And the thing that is referenced here in this question is start, start saving up points. Well, they're not referring to green stamps. They are referring to the continuing education unit credits. By the way, I didn't even give you a CEU in that first hour, by the way. Nobody pinged me on that one. Chat room, you got to keep me honest on that one. It's not your fault. It's my fault. Uh, the CEUs, in fact, I'll give you one now. If you're listening, uh, why not give you a CEU? If you're wanting to earn a continuing education unit credit, I would be glad to give you one because you can save up these credits to work towards renewing your certification. Obvious, uh, unfortunately, you can't use all of these from the same source. You have to mix them up a little bit. The type of CEU that I'll be providing to you is a webinar category CEU. It's a webinar CEU. So one of the ways that you can earn a webinar CEU from me is you go to the top or the bottom of the Professor Messer website. You click the Contact Us link. Put in your name, your email address. In the subject line, put that this is December 2023 Core 2. And in the body of the message, on a line by itself, Put the super secret code word of the month. I want to use one that we used before because we did one. Let's use a super secret code word of APFS. APFS. Anybody remember what the APFS is? The Apple file system? The Apple file system APFS. That is your super secret code word of the month. If you then submit that and send it to me, in about a week, I'll turn these around. Maybe less, maybe more. I'll get back to you an email that has been digitally signed that certifies that you were here to watch one hour of this webinar, seminar, live event, and you will be able to use that and apply it towards the renewal process. And as I mentioned, you can't just watch replays of my study group to do this or attend live. There's many different things you would have to do if you are earning CEUs. So that is one of the useful things. Now, you can only start earning these CEUs after you are certified. So if you don't have any certification yet, this isn't going to help you. But certainly, if you're like Anonymous and you get your A-plus cert and you're thinking, when do you start saving these up? You start saving them up immediately. Don't wait three years to renew. You can renew any time during this three-year period, and it will extend it another three years. Not reset it to the date when you renewed. It extends it three more years. So take this into consideration. Let's say that you walk in and you have just finished your last exam and you took that last exam and you passed it. Now you're A-plus certified. If the next day you were to perform any of these functions to renew your certification, let's say you renewed it the next day, you collected CEUs, you did any of these things that they say that you can do, it will extend it three years. So you're effectively 
six years of a certification you now have. Normally, people don't do that, though. Normally, they're over it once they pass their second exam. Let's wait a while. We'll renew next year and work through that. But you could. Technically, you could do the numbers, and it would work out that way, just so that you're aware of those. So I think that's a, a good overview if you're looking to renew and working through those. That's, that's something you do need to know. Now, along those same lines, um, the, the question from Richard sort of asked a similar thing, who says, since getting Security Plus auto-renews A Plus and Network Plus, can you auto-renew those when you renew Security Plus? And in fact, that's the way it works. You only have to renew the highest level cert that you have earned. So if you have gone through the process of getting your A+, plus and you get your Network+, plus and you finally get your Security+, plus, now you're thinking, well, what do I, how do I renew all of this for the next three years? All you have to renew is your Security+, plus, and it will automatically renew any lower level certs, which begs the question, what is a lower level search? And perhaps more importantly, why do we use beg the question improperly there? Because we do. Uh, if you go to the CompTIA website uh, and you have a look at the renewal process, they have a whole section on the site of nothing but how to renew your CompTIA certification. And on, these, on the site, they go through the renewal cycles, what these CEUs are, and how you can renew. I'm going to renew by earning a higher level certification. And as I mentioned, higher level has a different connotation there. May, you're trying to figure out, well, what's a lower level and what's a higher level? It's okay. The CompTIA website has a whole chart that is effectively the, the pyramid of CompTIA, the pyramid of certifications. And we can start with the A plus down here. Obviously, the A plus doesn't renew anything. The network plus renews A plus. The Security Plus renews Network Plus and A Plus. And if you took the CISA or the Pentest Plus, it renews Pentest Plus, Security Plus, Network Plus, A Plus, and CISA Plus, depending on which one you choose. So you have different options. They're all on the CompTIA website. They're very well documented there. And if you're someone who's trying to figure out where do I where do I go from here? Where do I where do I renew these things? Do I have to do A Plus and Network Plus if I have Security Plus? You don't. Just focus on Security Plus, and the rest will auto-renew with it. So that's kind of nice to be able to do that. Uh, as folks in the chat room are asking, but what if I have Security Plus and Network Plus lifetime, but I'm just getting my A+. Plus? This means that you've been around for a while. This means you're old like me. So you have the, the lifetime certifications, which had no expiration on them, were back in 2011, 2012. This is 10 years ago. This is a while back. So you've had these certifications for a while. Because technology changes, because operating systems get updated, hardware changes, uh, the cloud shows up. You know, you didn't have cloud computing in your, your lifetime A-plus that you took 10 years ago. So because these technologies change over time, most people that are looking for an A-plus cert do not want your lifetime cert. To them, it doesn't even exist something you took 10 years ago. It doesn't even apply to what we do these days. And so almost all employers will specify we want the, the CE version of your A+, plus, Network+, plus, or Security+. Plus. That is the one for continuing education, that when you get that certification, it requires you renew it every three years. And in fact, you may recall back when you got your lifetime cert and they were converting over to the three-year renewal, they even sent you a note that said, do you want us to convert this over to the three-year? If you do, you just have to ask. And then you can just maintain it and update it every three years. And if you didn't, they asked that for like a year. And after that, they said, okay, well, I guess you don't need it then. Now we're done. So if you did not convert it back in the day, then you probably don't have that to renew you would have to take the A-plus again to earn the CE version, and then you can renew it over time. Just one of those weird things that happen during the conversion process, during the, the switchover between always there and lifetime cert and three-year cert. Um, it's one of those. So hopefully that, that gives you a perspective of things you need to know. Um, so that that's the important part. Um, those lifetime certs aren't going to help you very much at this point. You will need to get the CE version of the certs to be able to renew that. So if you have your current A plus CE and 
you have a Lifetime Network Plus and Lifetime Security Plus, those aren't going to help you renew your A+. Plus. You're going to have to earn the Network Plus CE or the Security Plus CE. So you got a little work to do along those lines. But if you got those certs back then, you're just updating yourself. It's not a big deal to go through and take those certs. Again, I'll bet you'll have no problem at all doing it, too. Other questions. Uh, let's keep going. Um, if we have other ones that are on here, uh, I've got a lot that are that are coming through here. So this is um, this is a pretty good question. It's very broad, but I think a lot of us have to deal with this. Um, Hashim asks, I took the core two recently and I didn't pass. I struggle with a couple of the performance based questions. How do I better prepare for the PBQs? So I think there's two ways to approach this. And this is an important consideration because we've done quite a bit of research on this on ProfessorMesser.com. There have been people, and you will find them showing up in the chat all the time in our Discord, who talk about their exam experience. Of course, they talk broadly because you have a non-disclosure. You can't talk about the content on the exam. But the things that they have said, and this is from more than one person, has said, I took my core one or I took my core two or I took my network plus, I took my security plus, and I ran out of time. I skipped over the performance-based questions at the beginning with the intention of coming back to them. And I went through all of the multiple choice section. And let's say, let's say that on your exam, five of the questions were performance-based, and then you got 80 multiple choice questions because you could get a maximum of 90 questions overall but you usually get less than that. So let's say the rest of the exam was 80 questions. It was an 85 question exam total. And they got through all of the multiple choice questions and they were working their way to come back to the first performance-based question and time ran out. And they said, I didn't put anything down for any of the performance-based questions. So therefore I didn't get any of them right. I didn't get any points for performance-based questions, but I still passed their final score was still good enough to pass the exam. So there is a, there is a, a, a challenge with, the, a, with any of these CompTIA exams in that we don't know how they score them. They don't tell us how they score them. There's no way to reverse engineer how they score them. There's no specifics about how much value is associated with one question or another. And to this day, we don't know if performance-based questions are worth more, less, or the same as any of the other multiple-choice-based questions. And there's no way for us to ever know. So a lot of people worry about this. They worry about the grading or the system or how many points or how many questions they need. Well, don't worry about it because you can't control it. And even if, even if you had uh, some inkling, it's just a guess. It's complete speculation as to how these grades work. But what we know is that it is possible for you to take all of the multiple choice section and not answer any of the performance-based questions and still pass this exam. Now, I'm not saying you should not answer the performance-based questions. I guess in some ways I kind of am. But I think that a lot of people put too much emphasis on the performance-based questions. They put too much of a worry on the performance-based questions and spend so much time trying to find additional performance-based questions. There are, by the way, for the, to firstly answer your question, I would be remiss if I didn't mention that in my book, there are performance-based questions. So I do have performance-based questions as part of my practice exams book. There are five in each exam. There are three exams in here. Therefore, there are 15 performance-based questions in my book. So... I tell people there are places you can go to kind of get a feel for what these are. But if you're spending all of your time worrying about performance-based questions, then you are limiting what you could be learning in the rest of the exam objectives. And by the way, you could pass the entire exam without performance-based questions, at least in some situations. At least some people have. In that particular case, every exam has a different set of questions. Therefore, every exam is graded differently. Therefore, every exam has a different balancing act between performance-based questions and multiple choice. I'm not saying this is every exam that you get, but it does, of course, give you a perspective of how non-crucial, critical, or, or 
end of the world it is with the performance-based questions. I think a lot of people look at those performance-based questions as a nuclear option. I have to get those right or I fail the entire exam, which in reality isn't the case at all. So that's why whenever you start going through performance-based questions and get a question like this where, how do I better prepare? I didn't get the performance-based questions. I'm, I know I'm reading more into this than you probably were, Hashima. I am, I am giving you a little drama in this, to be sure. But all I'm really saying is don't worry about it that way. Focus on the objectives. Focus on the exam objectives. And let's bring up, for example, the exam objectives. Here they are for the Core 2 exam. So, for example, let's start with Section 1 in Domain 1.0 for Operating Systems. Section 1 says, identify basic features of Microsoft Windows editions. For example, in Windows 10, you need to know what the differences are between Home, Pro, Pro for Workstations, and Enterprise. That's it. Notice that you don't need to know about Windows 11 and the additions, although to be fair, Windows 10 and Windows 11 from an edition perspective are practically identical. So when you know Windows 10, you sort of know Windows 11, but they don't ask you about Windows 11, at least and not in the exam objectives. You also have to know about feature differences, domain access versus workgroup, desktop styles or user interface, the availability of remote control pro or remote desktop protocol, RDP. We need to know about random access memory support limitations between those editions, BitLocker, and gpedit.msc. So for the people that come to my chat and they go, why do you give us all these Windows stats about memory and the different editions? And why do I have to memorize that? Because it's in the objectives. It's clearly written in the objectives that you need to know that. That's why it's in there. So those are things you need to know. Spend time memorizing each one of those memorizing each one of these bullets. Everything that's in here, you need to memorize. So then go to the second section. So in the second section is 1.2. Given a scenario, use the appropriate Microsoft command line tool. And then they give you all the command line tools. CD, DIR, or DIR, MD, RMDIR. You've got IP config, ping, hostname, netstat, NSLOOKUP, check disk, net user, net use, trace route, and format, and the, and the others. So you have to know all of those. My point is, as you step through this and you start checking off all of these bullets, you now are accumulating a knowledge base in your brain. And so you can now answer multiple choice questions with the knowledge that you have now accumulated. And you can answer performance-based questions with that knowledge that you have accumulated. As I mentioned before, being able to answer performance-based questions the the worry is not how the questions look. The worry is about what topics are they covering. So the questions are pretty easy if you know the answers. Really doesn't matter how they ask the question. They can ask it as a fill in the blank. They could ask it as a matching question. They could do some drag and drop things. But as long as you know the content, it doesn't matter how they ask it. So my feedback on this one is, or for... Uh, for the question that we had up was don't worry so much about necessarily preparing for the performance-based questions. I think preparing for performance-based questions is exactly the same way that you would prepare for multiple choice-based questions. I don't think there's any difference between those. In your mind, there shouldn't be. Now, obviously, functionally, they are different on the exam, but don't worry about that part of it. And quite honestly, you've already taken Core 2 before. You're at a huge advantage the next time through because you've already seen questions on the exam, at least some of them. And statistically, some of the questions that you've already seen are probably going to show up again on your new exam. Obviously, it will be a different combination of questions on the next exam you take, but some of them are bound to show up again because that's the way statistics work. And... You might even see performance-based questions show up again. And I bet you remember the performance-based questions from the first exam that you took. So make some notes. There's no, You can't share that information with others, but you can absolutely use that information for your own use. So take plenty of notes. Think about the performance-based questions you got. Read up on all of the things they asked you to do. That's That's the important part. So I think if you are worrying about performance-based questions, that's a valid worry. So that's an absolutely valid question, Hashim. That is something you should think about. Just don't worry over it or stress over it or obsess over it 
or spend all of your time studying specifically around performance-based questions and neglecting the raw content that you need to know from the exam objectives? That's the important part. So um, great question, by the way. Thank you for submitting it. I saw you in the chat room. Thanks. I, I appreciate you putting that in there. Um, along those same lines, uh, Manu in the chat room asks, how much time can you wait between core one and core two for the A+. You can wait as long as you'd like, as long as the exam series does not retire. So I mentioned earlier, in fact, I'll bring this, let me bring this slide back up just so we can talk to this. Early on in the study group, I talked about when the core one and core two were released. And the current versions of the core one and the core two were released in April the 20th of 2022. So the 2-2011-01 and the 2-2011-02 were released on that day. We think the exams are going to retire, which means the 1101 and 1102 will no longer be able to take in an exam center. That retirement is going to be somewhere around November of 2025. So let's say it's November the 1st of 2025. Let's say when that retires. The date is actually going to be something different, probably. We'll know more as we get closer to November of 2025. But I think that's a pretty good estimate. It could very well be November of 2025. So let's say on April the 20th, you walked into an exam center, you took the 1101, and you passed it. You now have passed one of the exams out of the two that you need to earn to get your A-plus certification. And so the question that Manu asked, which was a good one, now how much time can you wait between taking the first exam that you take and taking the second exam you need to take? And the answer is you can wait until November the 1st, or I guess October 31st of 2025. And you could wait until the last day that exam is offered and you can take that exam and pass it. And if you pass it, you're A-plus certified. You're not A-plus certified until you pass both of those exams. So obviously, I don't really recommend waiting three and a half years between exams. That's not what I'm saying. Please don't take that as that's, I heard Professor Messer, he said, wait three and a half years. But that's not what I'm saying. I'm saying you could and still you would be A-plus certified. What you don't want to have happen is take and pass your first exam and then you're not able to take the second one and pass it before the exam series retires. If you waited and didn't take the second exam and November of 2025 came around and that exam series was retired, you would have to start over. Oh, hurts right there, doesn't it? Ouch. You do not want to be in that situation. You do not want to have to scrap all the work you did and restart this whole process again. So I highly recommend that you take one exam, you get it out of the way, and then you can start working on the other exam as it makes sense for you and the retirement schedule. Always check your retirement schedule to know when these exams are going away. Um, some people feel that you only have a year between exams. That's completely made up. That's never been the issue. It's never been a policy. It's always been you can take you just need to take both of these exams before, before they are retired. That's that's what the one would be. So um, so here's a here's a for instance for instance, uh, Hussein in the chat room says if I was to take my exam next year, my core one in May 2024. This is good. Would I be late to take my core two if I took it next year? Will I be too late to be a plus certified? If you take your core one and pass it in May of 2024, you just need to pass the core two before it retires in November of 2025. So that's your only number is the retirement date. That's all you have to worry about is the retirement date. We'll know specific dates as we get closer to that, but that's your retirement date is get all the way up to November 2025. Just pass both of them. In fact, it's easy now because these are the only two available. The answer is you have to pass both of these exams before they retire in November of 2025. That's it. That's your only rule. You can take them back to back. You can take them on the same day. You can take them years apart. Doesn't matter. You just have to take both of them before they retire in November 2025. Why didn't I say that when we started this? This could have been much faster. Because <laughs> I like to hear myself talk, I guess. I don't know why, but that's uh, so true. Uh, now back to the questions people are really asking about. Uh, let's go through one of those. Uh, for example, is that a Rubik's Cube behind you? What is that? What is this thing? over? Oh, it's on this side. Sorry. What is that? 
What is that thing? Let's get it bigger. What is Is that a Rubik's Cube right there? It is a Rubik's Cube. Now, it is. it doesn't work anymore. It was an electronic Rubik's Cube. You have to, you have to power it on, and then it lights up and does everything. I used to have the power, and I could plug it in. Do I have it? Let me look real quick. So for those, this is your chance, everyone. For those of you that said, does he have legs? How does that work? Yes, I do. Okay. Um, no, where's the power? I don't know where the power is. Oh, I used to have it handy. Is it over here? No. Okay. I'm going to tear the, the whole thing apart. And by the way, not a green screen. Who knew? So there you go. Not a green screen. The November date for A+, plus, for those of you in the chat room that are looking for that, is 2025. 2025. Not 2024. A year, almost two years from now. So there you go. Uh, this is, ah, this is, there it is. Uh, I bet it doesn't start up. I wish, I, I bet the uh, power is actually right underneath. And we could waste a lot of time here with me powering this up. But we power it up, it lights up, and then it's here. And then you, it's very impractical because these don't turn. Urgh, this is one big solid cube. So you, it's actually, sent, it's got a sensor on it. So you slide your finger to spin around the different sides of the Rubik's Cube. It's awful. It's not great. It was a, it was a gift uh, from uh, Uncle Phil and Aunt Mary at Uncle Phil's Fudge. It was a very nice gift from them. And I, I have enjoyed it immensely until it just simply didn't work anymore. And for me, I'm one of those guys that I like to solve the cube by like going really fast. Back when, back in the day when these things came out, uh, me, me and the guys, me and the boys, uh, would we had our Rubik's Cubes, as one does, and uh, we would get um, kind of a silicone type of lubricant. So you could, you could really spin those Rubik's Cubes around and you go really fast and we'd have competitions. How fast can we do it? We were, you know, in the, in the world of, of fast Rubik's Cube, you've seen them on the internet where they, they pick it up and seven seconds later, they've done it. That's not me. Seven minutes later, I'm there. I got gotcha. you. Uh, but I enjoyed doing it anyway. It was a lot of fun. I, I was never able to do the this, this speed solving on the cube. And it's not a magic trick either. One of those where you throw the cube up and boom, it turn, that's not how it works, everybody. But that, yes, it is, a, it is a, an electronic Rubik's Cube. And one of these days I will find the power for this. It's now, now uh, it's, it's irritating me that I don't have that handy for you. I so apologize. But a lot of fun uh, to be able to do that. Uh, and having that, that is what was behind me. That's the Rubik's Cube. See, those are the, the hard-hitting questions we're really looking for, people, is, is getting all of those done. Um, somebody just asked about the CEU for the study group. I'm glad we were able to take care of that, albeit in the second hour. I hate doing that, but I apologize um, for those. So um, this was not submitted in here, but it's such a good question in the chat room that I'm going to take it, Mike, uh, for doing that. I'm, I'll, I'll pull it from there. Absolutely. Uh, the question from Mike says, how much do acronyms come into play? Well, from the, and we'll talk about the second part of that question in just a moment. So let's go back to our exam objectives. I've already stepped through a number of the domains of the objectives and the individual domains that are there. But you'll notice if you, some folks in the chat room talking about Cert Master for A+, it's actually also on my website at a discounted price, too. Not just the vouchers, but so all the Cert Master products are as well. Uh, you'll notice in the back of the exam objectives are all these acronyms. Pages and pages of acronyms. Three pages. I guess two and a half. Two and a half pages of acronyms. A um, lot that's there. So you've got a ton to go through. I think... This is not entirely necessary that you start learning these acronyms and names because what should happen is as you go through your exam studies, these acronyms will just naturally show up. So when you talk about hard drives, SMART is automatically going to show up. You'll automatically learn that one. When you start working with memory, a... Um, Working with the different memory types, a, a DIM. You'll know what the, 
the uh, the SRAM is. You'll know what working and when you start the machine and post start, you'll know what post is. So a lot of these terms, you're just going to learn organically as you go through the exam content. So you can, of course, go to the back of the exam objectives and go through this acronym list. You, you can absolutely do that. But um, it's not necessary. I think you're going to learn it automatically, organically, naturally as you go through the exam objectives um, and learn what's in the books and the videos and other places. That's why you'll notice that when you're in my videos, I tend to show acronyms, but I also spell them out and often I say them just so we can get accustomed to what those things are. Sometimes we use acronyms so much that we tend to forget that there's actual words here that are associated with it. So I try to interject those in my questions and other places as well. In fact, if you go to my my um, practice exams, I might use an acronym in the question, but I always spell out the acronym in the answer. So it's another chance for you to, to learn those things. But how about the big question from Mike who says, how many pins on X-type memory? How many volts does an 8-pin GPU cable supply? This seems silly to study. I'm, and I guess my question is, who told you to study that? Why are you studying the number of pins on memory? Why are you studying how many volts an 8-pin GPU PSU power supply puts out? And, and I say that not to be, I'm not trying to be confrontational. I'm just sort of saying in the broad scheme of things, Mike, why are, why are you even doing that? Because if you go to the exam objectives and you go to the section that deals with memory or, or different connectors for power, none of those things are in there. The exam objectives tell you what you need to know and how you need to learn those things. And, and in fact, gives you by, by its natural, by the, the information that's already written on the page, they tell you the scope you need to know of those things if you read it close enough. So if you have an, a um, if you have a question that you're seeing on a set of exam questions somewhere, and they're asking you how many pins does this memory have, or they're asking you what is the voltage of this wire on a on this particular power cable, you can automatically discard that particular set of practice exams because they aren't even applying it to the exam objectives. Has nothing approaching that in the exam objectives. Stick to the objectives. Stick, stick, stick to the objectives. Incredibly important that you know that. So if you, in fact, other people in the chat room are saying, yeah, I got a question on a practice exam I took, and they asked me this thing. And that that's not in the exam objectives. It asked me how many pins are on this memory. Not in the objectives. It asked me the voltage for this wire. Not in the objectives. Why? In fact, I don't even know if I can tell you the number of pins, number of pins on a memory. Because we don't need to know that. Who needs to know that? Nobody needs to know that. Because memory, especially DDR memory, DDR2, DDR3, DDR4, DDR5, all of those memory types are keyed. So all you have to know is which one you need for the, your motherboard. If your motherboard supports DDR4, you need DDR4 memory. DDR3 physically won't fit. DDR5 physically won't fit on the motherboard. So why nobody's counting pins. In fact, if you go buy memory... They don't tell you how many pins the memory has. They just go, well, that's DDR4. It'll work on anything that's DDR4. I love the people in the chat room are going, oh, it's 260 or 280. Who cares? It doesn't matter. Nobody, nobody uses this content in the world other than badly written exam questions. So that's what, sorry. And people are going, yeah, but I studied that. Well, sorry. I'm not sure why you studied it. It's not in the exam. I know why you studied it because you saw a question about it on a badly set of bad badly written set of practice exam questions. You don't need to know it. If it's not in the exam objectives, you don't need to know it for this exam. And in the case of how many pins are on memory, you don't need to know it generally speaking. It's not going to help you. Uh, let's do another question for those. That's probably that's probably one of the most popular questions I get by the way is do I need to know this? Is this a thing I need to know for the exam? And my my answer is always is it in your set of exam objectives? That's what we need to know. That's it. So um, it's 568 versus 568B, what's the wire layout? That's actually practical. So just because you're memorizing doesn't mean everything you're memorizing is bad. If you were to pick up a network cable right now and look at it, you should be able to tell whether that's wired for A or B because you're going to need to wire the other side for the same thing. 
being able to look at, especially put two wires together and look at them. I wish I had an Ethernet cable with me. Where's my cables? I don't have one. You should be able to pick up that cable, turn it around so you can really see the wires going into the RJ45s on both sides and look to see, is this a crossover cable? Is it a straight through cable? If it's a straight through cable, what's the wiring scheme on both sides? Because maybe you need to cut one of these off and replace the side, replace one of those. You need to know how you're wiring that connection. That information is in the exam objectives. You know why it's in the exam objectives? Because it's valuable information to know. You're going to run into this all the time. You'll need to know how to do this. And in some cases, you'll need to crimp your own cables. So of course, you're going to need to know this. Uh, that's the important part. And you'll, you'll absolutely need to be familiar with that. Um, so if it's in the objectives, you need to know it. If it's not, you don't. So 568A versus 568B is it's in the core one objectives. It absolutely is. So that's a that's a pretty good example of things that are important to know versus finding the things that are not important to know. If it's in the objectives, you need to know them for the exam. If it's not in the objectives, you do not need to know them for the exam. Why do you find questions from other authors that are asking you about things that aren't in the objectives? I don't know. I don't know why they do this, but they do. And I tend to be the, the recipient of those questions. I, why'd they ask me that? Even better is people saying, well, your questions were okay, but they didn't ask me how many pins were on memory. Therefore, your questions must not be very accurate. Those are my favorites. Like, okay, you can't win. There's nothing I can do at this point. The only thing I can tell you is stick to the objectives. That's going to take you all the way through every single time. Uh, let's get some more. Um, <laughs> Dick says, thanks for being more than helpful. I'm not sure if that's sarcasm <laughs> or if it's being actually sincere. And that just tells me that I'm talking too much if I have to worry about that. Next question on our list. I just cracked myself up. Let's go through... Um, Let's see. This is a pretty good one. So uh, since we were talking about this earlier, some folks in the chat room saying, where can I get these objectives? Professormesser.com slash objectives. Or go to your favorite exam. Uh, go to your favorite search engine. Type in CompTIA exam objectives. It'll take you right there. They're free to download. It's a great place to go. That's the best way to do it. And it'll be your number one when you find it there. Uh, this is from Jimmers. Jimmers asks, I took an exam recently and I failed. I was so caught up with having a time limit. We've all been there. I felt like given enough time, I could have gotten all the questions right. However, I was so caught up on the time limit. Do you have any tips on how to remain calm and answer the questions I can get to? This is my problem on the exam as well. I am not a good exam taker, at least certification exams. Whenever there's money on the line, I'm not good at this. Don't ever put me in a situation where I have to do some type of physical challenge based on a, a cash bet. It's not going to happen. I'm going to choke every time. It's not, not going to go well. And exams are exactly the same way for me. As I walk into the exam room, I'm already nervous. I'm, I'm hyped up. The adrenaline is running. You know, you kind of hear a high-pitched noise in your ear. It's really a, a challenge to, to figure it out. So I... I always, here's what I do on CompTIA exams. This doesn't necessarily work this way for other manufacturers. But what I do is if I was to jump right into the exam and I got to the first question. So let's take the first question we had today. I'm just going to pull it up on the screen. Okay. Let's say I sat down for the exam and I just, okay, we're here. All right. Okay, go. We just start immediately. Go, 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 go. And the first thing that comes up is a, uh, the document you have to sign that is your candidate agreement. It's the non-disclosure agreement you have to sign. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Click, 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 click. Go, 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 go. Get your first question is up in 15 seconds. You just pass through all of it. And the question says, which phase of the malware removal process may require WinPE? Which phase of the malware removal process may require WinPE? What phase of the... I'm so nervous and so hyped up and so under such levels of anxiety that I have no idea what I'm reading. I don't even know what those were. I can see that it's English. I see that it's a language I understand. However, I'm so out of my element that I'm reading which phase of the malware removal process may require WinPE, and I'm not able to understand anything I'm reading. 
That's how nervous you can get on these exams. Now, after you go through about 10 minutes or so of sitting down and you're kind of get through these questions, you got to work it out. And then after about 10 minutes, I'm able now to go through and understand a little better what I'm reading. I kind of come, get into a comfort zone and, and now you're in the exam, you're doing well, but you wasted 10 minutes with your anxiety. That happens to me all the time. So here's my tip for the CompTIA exams, which is they give you about 15 minutes before you click the start button on your exam. They, they'll bring you in the room. If you're taking it at home, then you're taking it at home. But let's say you're an exam center. They bring you in the room. They sit you down in front of the monitor, and they click start. And the first thing that comes up is you have to read and, and agree to the CompTIA candidate agreement. Now, in my first example, I just click, 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 and we just got to the questions. But what I would recommend you do, they say, Thank, okay, good luck, and they leave the room. You have 15 minutes with the clock stopped to read through the candidate agreement. And maybe you should read it. You might have read it before, but you got 15 minutes. Waste the 15 minutes if you want. Or read through the candidate agreement for 15 minutes. Just read through it. <sighs> Kind of take the room in. Maybe they gave you some earplugs. You can put your earplugs in. You can uh, you can kind of focus on what the computer setup is like. Adjust the keyboard. Which is the keyboard? Get the mouse just right. Is this? Look at this. An old mouse has like a mouse ball. Look, it's old old thing. Okay, we're now ready. We're comfortable. We've read through the candidate agreement. We've kind of worked out all the adrenaline. It's no longer. In our, in our system, now we can click, yes, I agree to the candidate agreement and click to start the exam. And the first question is, which phase of the malware removal process may require WinPE? And that is, of course, the mitigation phase. Next question. So you're already in it. You're already comfortable. You can understand English. <laughs> you can read. Those are pretty, pretty useful to be able to kind of ease into the exam. The second one is more about understanding where you're going to get that time from on the exam. Time management on the exam is a big deal. 90 questions in 90 minutes is effectively your challenge. Hopefully, you got fewer than 90 questions, but they're already taken into account that some of these questions are diff more difficult than others. So that's where you really need to focus is how do I watch the clock. Now, fortunately, the clock is always at the top of the screen. It's always counting down. You can always see it there. So there should be some visibility to that. The other thing that I think would really help, Jimmers, is there is the option on the exam to mark a question. And what I do on my exam, here's a, here's a free tip from my Exam Hacks ebook. I go through the, the exam twice. The first time I go through it, I'm going really, really, really fast. I read the question. If I know the answer to that question 100%, there's no question I got that one right. I know the question. I know the answers. I know which ones are wrong. I know which one is right. I'm, I've got that one absolutely correct. There's It's answer B, boom. And if I know that one's solid and I feel like that's 100% correct, I just go to the next question. And it, But if the next question is one where oh, I'm only 80% on this one, I mark what I think the 80% is and I click the flag button for that question and I keep going. So I really don't spend any time thinking about it. I go through it very quickly the first time answering and if I don't know it 100%, if I only know it 99%, I hit the flag button and I flag that question. Once you go through all the questions, it brings up a page that says, here's everything you answered and here's a list of all the questions that you flagged. And now you could easily jump to any question on the exam at any time. This is very unique to CompTIA, by the way, relatively unique to CompTIA. If you were to take a Cisco exam, for example, you can't do this. Because with Cisco, when you submit an answer, that's it. It is locked in forever. You can't go back. You can only go forward. So this is a great advantage you have taking these CompTIA exams is you can jump around to any question at any time. So all I do is now I start going through the flagged questions again, going, well, I was 80% on this one. But now that I've gone through the other 80 questions, there was a question about this on question 70 that jogged my memory about question 7. 
And now I'm not only 80% sure, I'm 100% sure we'll keep that answer and we'll go to the next one. That's what I do. Uh, all the time watching the clock. And that's the key is watching the clock. Time management is so important. I even tell you in my book, if you're, my books are literally books for the practice exams. They are reading through and answering the questions as you go. And I tell people, it's in the how to use this book section at the very beginning. I tell people, start a timer. Put it right in front of you. Start the clock. Use this not only as a knowledge check, but you might also want to use this as a time check to see if you can get through questions that quickly. Because I designed the questions in this book to have a similar style, a similar structure, a similar time as an actual exam question. So that's that's the the key for me. So those are my two tips. One is to have a nice delay at the beginning of the exam where you're just settling in and you're reading through the candidate agreement and you're just using every bit of time to do that. And the second one is use that flag button. It will help you a lot with flagging those and, and being able to jump back to things that you're not 100% on. That can really help you a bit and work through them. Uh, others, let's keep going that on uh, other questions we might have. How am I on time? I'm way over time. We're way past the top of the hour, but I got a couple more I want to go through. So uh, let's do this. Um, next on our list, I'm going to, um, there's an actual question I want to do. I say actual. Chris has an actual question, but it's not really, but I'm going to answer it anyway. Chris asks, which coffee should I drink to study for the exam? Um, this is completely up to you. I, I am not much of a coffee drinker anymore. I have a cup in the morning. And that's it for the day. I tend to stay away from caffeine because I find that I'm relatively sensitive to caffeine and it'll keep me up at night. So I don't tend, I'm one of those people, you know, those people, they, they seem like they're fun, but they don't drink coffee. Uh, those folks, I'm one of those. Um, but I love coffee. I was just watching a, a video on YouTube as one does where you're just like, oh, that looks, the algorithm found something I've never found before. And it said, you might think of this as being interesting. And it was uh, making um, making Turkish coffee. I love Turkish coffee. That would be fantastic. Uh, I like an espresso. I like a strong coffee, which ironically doesn't have a lot of caffeine in it, which not ironically, I guess that works out, doesn't it? Um, but uh, that's, I, I love a strong flavored coffee. Um but you don't need any coffee for the exam. You're good. Uh, lots and lots of scotch. That's all I can. That's all I can recommend. Lots and lots of scotch. Um, a fine question though. Next on our list, don't drink a lot of scotch for your exam. For those of you wondering, that was done in jest. The question I have that was a real question, not that the other one wasn't, but you know what I'm saying. Uh, next on our list. Uh, is this question, that was all the questions. This question from Aaron who says, what certification would you suggest after we're done taking A plus network plus security plus? All right, so there is, of course, an aspect to this on the exam we have to think about is that there's, there's A plus, there's network plus, security plus. What do you do after that? And everybody's got an opinion of what they should do after this. Everyone will tell you, well, you need to do Cisco. Well, you need to do a cloud. You need to do Linux. You need to, they'll tell you everything. But the answer is, nobody knows the right answer to this question for you, because everybody has a different path. These certifications are not on a rail. These are not on, well, I did A+, plus. now I have to do Network Plus next, now I have to do Security Plus next, now I have to do CCNA next, now I have to do uh, AWS next, now I have to do whatever. That's not the way it works. What's next on your list, what I would suggest next is whatever certification gets you that much closer to your next set of goals. And in some cases, we don't get to decide that. In fact, in most cases, we don't get to decide that. In most cases, someone else decides that for us. Let's say, for example, you've earned your A+, your Network+, plus, your Security+, plus. you're working in a, a network operations center, and you're ready to move up, maybe to work, and you're ready to work with the networking team. And if you talk to the networking team and say, I'd like to move out of the network operations center front end on tier one, I'd like to be part of the networking team. What do I need to know? And they'll tell you, well, you need network plus or you need, maybe you need Cisco CCNA. Maybe they'll just tell you like, okay, well, there's the next thing I need to work on. 
But what if you're in this network operations center and you think stuff they're doing over here in the cloud is amazing. I'd love to be part of the cloud team. You ask the cloud team, hey, what do I need to know to be able to get a job working on the cloud team? What certification should I focus on? Tell you, oh, you need to go get the Azure certification on this, or you need to get the AWS certification on this. They don't even mention Cisco. Okay, well, now you're going that direction. You need to work on those cloud-based certifications. Maybe uh, you want to do more with the Windows operating system. You want to be server administration or even desktop administration. Well, they'll come back to you and say, we need this Microsoft cert. Something different. So what's next is going to be very subjective. And it should be because everybody has a different set of interests. Everybody has a different set of opportunities available to them. Everybody has a different set of personal goals and objectives. So you need to find somehow to mash those together. In fact, sometimes the certification you're going after isn't necessarily the one that you really wanted to do. But the hiring manager says that's the one they want. And if you want that job, that's the one you're going to need to go get. So as much as everyone else has an opinion on this, and we all do, as to what we think your next certification would be, our opinion doesn't matter. Doesn't. What really matters is what you want, how you're going to get there, and what certifications will allow you to move from point A to point B. That's the important part. So that's my recommendation. It's kind of a non-answer. It's kind of the worst answer I can give, which is, I don't know. Depends. <laughs> Those are the worst answers ever. But they're also the most accurate, especially in this particular case. Um, I know we're way past time. I want to get one more of these in before we are we're working through this uh, and making it happen. So uh, let's do another one that has come in here. I don't want to be too straightforward with these. And there's some that are a little self-serving, so we're not going to do those right now. This whole thing is relatively self-serving. So I recognize you don't want to be preached to or told or advertised to the whole time. So we're not going to do that. Um, so let's talk about transitioning, because this is kind of along the lines of that last question, but we're really kind of focusing on A plus and Network Plus. This is from Justin, who says, what's the best way to transition from studying from the 1102 and 1101 to Security Plus? Now, for those of you that are working on your A plus right now, you're working on your core one, you're working on your core two, you may be thinking, whoa, why would, oof, that's a jump. You're on A plus. Now you want to go Security Plus? You, you skipped over Network Plus. In fact, you already didn't even say that you had your A plus yet. You just said studying for 1102 and 1101. Maybe you've decided 1101, 1102 isn't for you. A plus is not your thing. Really, you need Security Plus. This, by the way, happens all the time. And I'll explain to you where it really mostly happens, that if you are uh, living in the United States in the D.C. area, Washington, D.C., you're in Virginia, you're in Maryland, you're in that federal D.C. area. A ton of these federal jobs uh, for the U.S. federal government require you, if you are in IT, require you to have a minimum of Security Plus. Now, the reality is that requirement is really one that is focused on the armed forces. So anything dealing with the Army, Navy, Air Force, Marines, Coast Guard, Space Jam, what are they called? All of that together is they, they require you in IT to have a minimum of a security plus. So they don't care if you have an A plus. We don't want that. They don't care if you have a network plus. Didn't ask for that. We want you to have, starting with, at its lowest level, they want you to have Security Plus. There's some other certs that you can get along with that, but from the perspective of those three, that's the starting point for not just armed forces, but all of the other federal government agencies have sort of latched on to those requirements and highly recommend the same requirements for themselves. And that's why you happen to see all of these different jobs in that particular area for IT, Security Plus, Security Plus, Security Plus, Security Plus, Security Plus. They all want Security Plus. And so a lot of people who come to ProfessorMesser.com, that's their first cert. They are not even familiar with IT. They're hopping into Security Plus as their very first IT certification because that's what employers want. This does kind of go back to that last question where it's not about you. It's not about me. It's about the hiring manager. And that's what they want. 
So uh, the best way to transition is just to grab the Security Plus exam objectives and start going through them. There is not much overlap between the A plus and the Security Plus. There's very little overlap between those two. Uh, there's obviously a whole section of security you need to know about. So, you know, you do need to know what a bollard is on the Security Plus. But there's so much more on the Security Plus. That's just one of many things that you have picked up at that point. So I think that's a real requirement is, uh, is understanding that. Now, if you are not in the D.C. area, let's say that you work in Dallas. Let's say that you're in Plano. And you have, uh, you've now working towards an IT position with a company based out of Plano, Texas. And you look at their job description, their job posting, Security Plus isn't on there. They want you to have A+. Plus. Okay, well, now you've got a different direction. Now you should go get your A plus instead of Security Plus. So some of these are these decisions we make about certifications. Some of them are based on geography, based on where the job is and who you're working for, because they really have important requirements. Ultimately, the same strategy applies. It's not up to me. It's not up to you. It's about the hiring manager. What certification do they want you to have? That's the one I'm going to recommend you get. Now, that's very, talk about self-serving. You are really serving that particular requirement because you know that there's a job on the line and they'll pay you money. So there is a an end to this means. There's a reason we're getting these certs. And I, of course, we could all talk about these certifications are important for making yourself a better technician. And they certainly do. These, these certifications are important for helping you learn some of the fundamentals that you need to be able to do your day-to-day -day job. Absolutely. Certainly applies. But sometimes you're getting a cert because there's cash money behind it. Let's be clear. There's many different motivations for getting a cert. And getting a job or getting a better job is certainly one of those. Ideally, money and a little more money behind all of these. So you need to figure out which which one of these makes most sense. Which one of these would really be the best approach to solving this problem? Do I just go out and get any cert I want, or do I get the cert they want me to have? That's that's the real question. Now, ultimately, and it's it sounds like I'm being very uh, restrictive, and it sounds like I'm not giving you any option in this. Like, you don't have a decision in this, but that's not entirely true. Once you get into the door, once you get your foot in the door in IT, you get your very first job in IT, you start to notice flexibility. You start to notice more options. And this is something I find very unique to information technology is that you can decide where you'd like to go from there because there are opportunities and jobs available in almost every aspect of IT. If you like desktop and laptop computers, you could be administrators for those. If you like servers, you want to do Linux administration, there's a job available for you. You want to do database admin, there's one of those. You want to manage the data center, there's a job for that. You want to do cloud technologies? There's technology jobs all about the cloud. You want to do something relating to security? Got some of those. How about network administration? There's jobs for that too. And we just keep going. Just keep going with all of these. So there are jobs out there, and you do have the ability, once you're in the door, to kind of lean that direction, to kind of say, I really like that networking stuff. I wonder if there's a job I could get. Let me talk to the networking team. Hey, guys, what do you think I should do? I'll go get you Cisco. All right, I'm going to go do that. That's how it works. So even though you started this process as I'm going to work in the help desk, someday I want to work in security, or someday it would be great to have one of these higher level senior engineering positions. Someday I'd love to work for Cisco. Someday I'd love to work for Palo Alto Networks. Someday I'd love to work for whatever company that is. Um, there are jobs out there where you can go work for those companies. They will hire you. They will fly you around the world fixing problems if you're good at this. They're, the jobs are available. You just have to uh, really work towards them. None of this comes without any type of, of pain. You really have to work on knowing this and really learning it and becoming familiar with the technologies. But once you become that that uber problem solver for that particular niche, you become a very valuable asset. 
and they like to pay you very well when you become that that very valuable asset. And that's what I hope we can take away from the A+, plus, the Network+, plus, and the Security+. Plus. This is our jumping off point. This is our springboard. This is a way to get in the door and position yourself for a career, a lifetime of upward mobility, of very nice pay, some of these higher level jobs, and a, a way to support yourself and the rest of your family. And that's our goal here. We want you to get a job or get a better job. There's many, way, many, many ways to make that happen. Uh, hopefully, you've got an idea of how some of those would work as it relates to the A+, plus, the Network+, plus, or the Security+, plus. and who knows what's next. There were some folks in the chat room going, what are you going to do next? Don't know yet. When I know, you'll know immediately. I just don't know. We'll, we'll figure it out uh, in finding ways to make all of these things happen. Um, I think that's probably a good place to kind of end our conversation regarding certifications and all the other things. That is our last A-plus certification study group of the year. How about that? We have some more live streams before the year is out. You can come back next week. On Wednesday, we've got a Network Plus study group. And a week after that, we have a Security Plus study group. We'd love it if you showed back up for those. Even if you're not studying for those, it's kind of fun to go through the questions, see what you know. And, of course, I'll take questions in the after show as well. Stick a, Come back on, on Wednesday of next week. It will be a good time to kind of look at what we're doing on our live streams and participate there as well. We'd love to have you back. Well, that uh, finishes up all of our live streams today. Again, if you loved what you listened to or even liked it a little bit, we'd love it if you give it a thumbs up on the YouTube side. Don't forget to subscribe to our channel at professormesser.com slash YouTube. Thanks for joining us. We will see you next time on the A Plus Study Group. Thanks, everybody.